Okay, uh, it's one o'clock. Uh, welcome, everyone. Uh, so this is the first time we organize this uh, workshop, Fairness in Machine Intelligence for Global Health. Uh, we uh, like to thank the National Science Foundation from USA for the support for the workshop. Uh, so the uh, let me briefly go over the schedule. Uh, we will first have the presenter present and please hold your question. And then uh, at the end of all the presentation, we will have a question and uh, answer section. And then we start with a panel discussion. So the first talk will be uh, given by River Schwartz from this, and that will be a video I will play. And then uh, Dr. Yi Ye Zhen, uh, followed by Candace Moore, and Brave Prakash from UK, and then uh, Joyce Wong from Purdue, and uh, Serena Gore from Florida, and then we have that discussion. So, okay, so this program also emailed to everyone. I hope that you also receiving the chat window. And please be aware all the material and uh, pictures, uh, those are uh, uh, belong to the individual presenter and panelists. And if you want to reuse some of the information, please contact them directly. So uh, I'm going to play the video pro uh, provided by the River first. agency that works with industry and other stakeholders to promote thank you for the invitation to be here i'm here to talk about NIST, our work in trustworthy and responsible ai including our work on the ai risk management framework and ai bias NIST is a federal agency under the department of commerce we're a non-regulatory agency that works with industry and other stakeholders to promote US innovation and industrial competitiveness through measurement science, standards, and technology. Artificial intelligence holds great promise. In the healthcare domain, it can provide significant benefits such as identifying new treatment protocols, streamlining diagnosis, and creating or enhancing administrative efficiencies. But it also comes with risks risks that can contribute to significant harms for individuals, communities, and society. In the health domain, AI has been shown to contribute to or exacerbate treatment disparities or inequities. We hear of people receiving inappropriate or ineffective medical treatment or being denied the right treatment due to their race, age, gender, or disability status, or by basing decisions about healthcare through the use of poorly defined or ill-suited proxies such as using cost as a stand-in for healthcare needs. The inequities described on the previous slide are largely driven by what are commonly referred to as biases. But what type of biases and where are they coming from? First, the question for bias in AI is not if a system is biased, but how, where, and for whom are these biases creating impacts or harms? The information on this slide is taken from our NIST document on bias titled Towards a Standard for Identifying and Managing Bias in Artificial Intelligence, also known as SP1270. The big takeaway from the document is that AI system risks and resulting negative impacts do not only stem from challenges with data sets, models, or algorithms. Or even more to the point, this is not just a tech problem. AI systems are built and used within organizational environments based on individual and group decisions across enterprises, reflecting a variety of incentives and purposes. Implicit factors, unknown or unarticulated system limitations, and a lack of systemic or structured approaches to consider these contextual factors can leave organizations vulnerable to the deployment of technology that can cause risks beyond the enterprise and ripple across society. In our document, we identify and describe three categories of bias, as you can see in the graphic. Computational biases are the ones we hear all about, talk about, and focus on. But the reality is much more complex. Current models that demonstrate perfect demographic balance 
or data representativeness can still cause harms. There are hundreds of fairness metrics, but we still have significant challenges deploying fair AI. So what are the other types of bias? We describe systemic biases and human cognitive biases, and we discuss how challenging these biases are because they can occur in the absence of prejudice, partiality, or discriminatory intent. These three categories of biases are not necessarily bad and do not always lead to harmful outcomes, but they can interact and create a pernicious mixture of bias that is difficult to address. So we know that computational approaches can only go so far. In fact, a recent preprint showed that race-based corrections for pulse oximetry metrics does not, quote, provide equal performance in the detection of hypoxemia, unquote. We really have this tension between computational approaches on one hand that are very focused on the pipeline and socio-technical perspectives on the other, which approach systems as much more than their mathematical constructs and suggest that AI systems are in fact doing a great job just at mirroring our societal inequities. In many cases, the challenges stem from an inability to properly take up, map, or integrate contextual factors within the AI lifecycle. First, we can't directly connect the specific biases, either the categories or types, to how they contribute to specific real-world harms within and across context. Second, bias isn't the only risk in AI. Bias interacts with other risks, such as privacy, security, and explainability. Measurement approaches remain system-centric, decontextualized, and based on laboratory rather than real-world testing and evaluation. So what can we do? How can we adapt our approaches out here in the real world to govern and design systems with impacts and context in mind? NIST recently released the AI Risk Management Framework, or AIRMF, a voluntary, not regulatory framework which provides organizations with a guiding structure to operate within and outcomes to aspire towards to manage the risks of AI technologies to individuals, communities, and society. It guides organizations to consider AI risks such as bias from a broader socio-technical perspective. This entails placing system-centric activities alongside and connected to efforts related to AI system governance, human factors, and consideration of real-world impacts within their specific contexts. This is operationalized through four core functions, govern, map, measure, and manage. Suggested activities within these functions provide organizations with the opportunity to directly assess risks and impacts and manage them within the context of their specific use cases. The framework and its accompanying playbook is not a checklist. It is meant to foster a risk-aware and impact-focused fo culture and normalize and standardize the development of trustworthy AI systems and responsible AI practice and use. The playbook is filled with actionable suggestions for how to do that. So what is AI system trustworthiness and how do we operationalize it? In the framework, we identify seven characteristics of trustworthy systems. Here is a very small sampling of actions that organizations can take within each of these characteristics. Many more suggestions can be found in the AIRMF playbook. First, validity and reliability, which underlies all of the other characteristics. Methods here include establishing and documenting approaches to measure construct validity and internal and external validity. Safety. Techniques to increase safety include employing test data assessments and simulations before proceeding to production testing and tracking multiple performance quality and error metrics. To enhance AI system security and resilience, organizations can use and document red team exercises that actively test the system under adversarial or stress conditions and measure system responses. For accountability and transparency, Organizations can track and audit the effectiveness of organizational mechanisms related to AI risk management, including lines of communication, roles and responsibility, and organizational accountability roles, such as chief model risk officers. For explainable and interpretable AI, organizations are encouraged to test explanation methods and resulting explanations before deployment with end users and potentially impacted groups about whether the explanations are accurate, clear, and understandable. Specify privacy-related values, frameworks, and attributes that are applicable in the context of use by engaging directly with end users and potentially impacted groups and communities. 
I'll discuss fairness and bias on the next slide, but keep in mind that there are always trade-offs between these characteristics and between trustworthiness and organizational incentives and societal values. NIST has a project for almost every one of these characteristics with ongoing research. There are specific callouts in the AIRMF playbook for managing bias. Most of these are computational approaches for managing computational forms of bias. That's where most of the work has happened, and we provide key steps for evaluating within group and intersectional group disparities, underlying data distributions, and for using sensitivity analysis for quantified harms. Also evaluating differences in distributions of outcomes across and within groups, including intersecting groups, and completeness, representativeness, and balance of data sources. But what about systemic and human biases? The work here isn't as far along for reasons I've best described in this presentation. Right now, our suggestions focus on decisions and decision-making processes across the AI lifecycle, on processes like impact assessments, formulation of problems and objective functions, construct validation, and human factors. Also on processes such as identifying the right stakeholders to establish context. This can help AI actors across the life cycle focus not just on how to build a given system, but what purpose that system can serve and what risks and limitations might be expected, including how impacts could happen. And of course, there's a, an enormous amount of human-centered design approaches to be borrowed here. So what else is needed to move the needle? <clears throat> We need to design systems with impact in mind, and that requires a lot of work and a lot of changes from how we currently approach AI. NIST will undertake a new evaluation series to address many of these factors. We intend to move from a focus on system performance to one on system impacts, one that takes real world impacts into account through direct study instead of a sole focus on computer-based simulations, also sometimes referred to as in silica testing. We seek to evaluate the role and impact of human and organizational factors such as governance, human AI teaming, and interdisciplinarity. This entire endeavor will be collaborative, so we look forward to working with you all on the next steps ahead. For more information, you can email us at aiframework.nist.gov, and please go to our just released uh, NIST Trustworthy and Responsible AI Resource Center at airc.nist.gov. Our next presenter is Dr. Yi Ye Chang from Will Cornell Medical College. Thank you very much. Um, could you allow share screen, please? You should be able. Great. Uh, can you all see my screen? Yes. Great, um, thank you so much for the um, invitation. Um, and um, I want to thank um, the first presenter's great overview on trustworthy um, AI. Um, so I think this is a good segue um, from the first presentation on the overall guideline. Um, what I would like to talk about in the next 10 minutes uh, is our firsthand experience of uh, developing and uh, currently implementing a AI model to predict um, postpartum depression um, and some of uh, our findings and lessons learned uh, in AI uh, for medicine and fairness. Um, so I wanted to uh, briefly go over the clinical domain uh, that we did this uh, project for. So um, Postpartum depression, um, as you may know, is a complex medical health condition. Um, it has long-term health effects to not just uh, the mother who de deliver um, the infant, but also to the overall family and children uh, in the long term as well. Currently, known risk factors for postpartum depression include um, previous mental health history, uh, current family situations, um, as well as other social determinants of health, um, and biological factors as well. And uh, what I would like to um, structure the next 10 minutes is to talk about um, AI 
um, the fairness of AI in this uh, eight uh, health informatics functional domains. Um, so in the next few slides, I'm going to explain why, why we decided to look into postpartum depression um, as an impactful area and um, how AI fits in uh, the clinical uh, problem as well as how fairness uh, fits in the, uh, this problem that we aim to address. So the current risk screening for postpartum depression is um, through manual questionnaires such as the Edinburgh Postnatal Depression Scale or EPDS. And uh, as you can see the questionnaire uh, in, on my slide, these tend to be uh, resource and knowledge intensive. So uh, in order to screen for a patient's risk, uh, we would have to have a clinician, um, either the, the medical doctor, um, social worker, or nurse practitioners in the clinic uh, answer uh, uh, questions by interviewing patients. And uh, a lot of the times in many clinics um, throughout the country, uh, we know that uh, there's um, challenges with finding the right people um, and having the right resource to conduct uh, these risk screening. And therefore, um, there are many patients um, whose depressive symptoms uh, or uh, signs for um, postpartum depression are, uh, are potentially being missed. So what, I, uh, so what we would like to propose uh, in our research is um, whether we can use information science and technology to understand uh, this cohort of pregnant patients, and can we use uh, IT uh, advanced technology, including AI, to help prevent and manage postpartum depression. And so uh, in our research uh, project, we use data from the electronic health records, uh, both uh, from New York Presbyterian Hospital Wild Cornell Medicine, as well as uh, the Insight Clinical Research Network. Uh, we used electronic health records or EHR because we were interested from the very beginning of implementing a uh, postpartum depression risk prediction tool inside uh, the electronic health record system so that patients who are found to be at risk of uh, this condition uh, can be managed uh, in a timely manner uh, without requiring additional data collection uh, or additional uh, resource and knowledge intensive uh, manual labor. So uh, in our model development, um, we looked at patients who were between the age of 18 to 45 and had child delivery uh, in our hospital. And uh, we used uh, various machine learning techniques um, applied uh, to a very large uh, data set of EHRs, including patients' demographics information, diagnoses, uh, including active and medical history, uh, their healthcare information, including what kind of medication they were being prescribed, um, how many times they've been uh, to the emergency department during a pregnancy, as well as laboratory tests, results, um, and uh, clinical notes. So we went through a very detailed and rigorous um, process of um, machine learning model development, uh, including clinical validation with our clinicians as well. Uh, so this was done earlier uh, and completed in, in the year of 2020. So we had a model that was trained outside of um, electronic health records system, but, but using uh, its log data. Um, so we felt that we were ready um, to start looking into implementation of this model that was built uh, using uh, the native electronic health records. Um, and uh, as part of the implementation, we did multiple evaluations uh, to look at the model performance. I think when we discuss and when we talk about um, fairness in AI, um, first we have to think about the balance between the model performance um, and uh, any potential uh, bias or fairness issues. So we started by just looking at um, how predictive the model is. Uh, for this particular model, what we wanted to predict uh, was whether uh, the model can accurately predict if a patient uh, would develop postpartum depression within uh, one year of child delivery. And if so, um, the in envisioned clinical workflow was that patients uh, may be connected to mental health care providers um, or they may be uh, prescribed antidepressants 
antidepressants um, or connected to social work. Um, so a positive prediction uh, in this case uh, was going to lead to um, uh, more interventions. And so we were interested in looking at um, first how, how uh, accurately can we predict as well as how soon can we deploy this model. So from the performance perspective, we looked at um, various um, time points during pregnancy. Um, as you know, pregnancy um, ranges uh, in, uh, in duration of about nine months. So we looked at if we deploy the model at 12 weeks of gestation, this is when patients are in the first trimester, how accurately does the model perform? And um, through, uh, throughout the pregnancy, um, how, how, increase, how much increase can we expect through the model? And after we confirm that uh, retrospectively, this model um, is quite uh, predictive, as you saw in the last slide, um, we wanted to investigate the social and behavioral aspect uh, of uh, this implementation, which is what is the legal and regulatory frameworks around the use of technology, and particularly what is the governance uh, process of um, AI and machine learning in our hospital at New York Presbyterian and well, Cornell Medicine. Um, and, uh, and I'm not going to go into much details for this slide, um, but the, the main uh, conversation that we've had is around which fairness metrics to evaluate and what are the protective values um, and pre what are the protected attributes as well as what are the privileged values um, for each model. As it's case by case, it really depends on how the model is going to be used. So in our case, a positive prediction was going to lead to higher chance of, um, uh, of intervention. It might be different um, for other models that are going to be used for different uh, clinical workflow. So in, in our case, uh, we did consider a protected attribute to be race and uh, we consider privileged value uh, to be white. So um, in our hospital, um, we are committed to um, analyzing algorithms and AI models to assess for bias and unfairness, and uh, we, we take actions, uh, or we aim to take actions when uh, either is identified. So in our fairness assessment uh, that was conducted uh, in multiple data sets from our hospital throughout multiple years, uh, we looked at the model performance, as I mentioned, we also looked at uh, three fairness uh, metrics that we felt was uh, appropriate for uh, this model where positive prediction uh, meant more intervention. So we looked at disparate impact, uh, equal opportunity difference, and average odds difference. Uh, the one area of, of improvement that we identified was on the disparate impact, which is uh, the, the ratio of positive, predictive, uh, positive prediction across uh, racial subgroups. Um, so what we did was um, we followed our um, we followed the general AI in medicine fairness guidelines, um, very similarly to the first um, pre uh, presentation, and we also followed um, our hospitals on AI uh, fairness policy, and uh, we reweighted the model um, according to the racial distribution in our population. And we also revised uh, race as a variable so that um, after the revision, we have a model that's, uh, that remains high in predictive accuracy and also have satisfactory uh, performance in terms of fairness metrics uh, as, as shown uh, in this slide. So where um, this is an example of how uh, we developed the model using machine learning. We retrospectively evaluated its performance, and we also prospectively uh, conducted more additional validation with specific focus on how the model would apply uh, in real case patient care scenarios and what are some of the concerns and get a, and um, trying to revise the model uh, in advance so that uh, we can protect um, any potential bias uh, from this model to our patients. Um, so we are um, currently uh, in this stage of uh, this project where we are actively working on implementation, delivering this um, AI model that we uh, evaluated fairness for, and we're actively thinking about systems development life cycle, um, how we can do prospective uh, testing to further confirm that the model is both um, 
clinically meaningful, and it's also um, fair to um, our patient populations. Uh, so to wrap up, um, I think health informatics, including AI, can facilitate um, these sort of continuous improvement uh, in a learning health system that goes from retrospective data to different aspects of um, data validation to perspective validation. So we're um, very excited and really passionate um, that we are able to do this uh, for our patients in our hospital. And I'm uh, looking forward, um, we want to engage um, not just the um, AI and um, machine learning community in health informatics, but we also would like to engage more of our clinical partners because we think that um, just because we can identify a risk does not mean that resources are available. And really what is uh, fairness in, a in AI goes beyond AI. We think that it's, um, it's a model that performs accurately. It's a model that performs fairly. And it's also a model that guarantees a fair resource allocation at the end of this loop. So um, we're working to engage more of our uh, clinical partners um, in terms of workflow design, data quality, uh, and um, looking at um, this overall culture of engaging AI uh, in medicine. Uh, so last but not least, I'd like to um, just acknowledge all of our collaborators, as well as um, our funders uh, for this project. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, please stay for the question and answer in the, uh, at the 205. Okay, so the next uh, is the pre-recorded uh, presentation uh, from Dr. Candice Makita Moore. Uh, Dr. Moore is here, but the We'll get to play her video. My name is Candice Nikita Moore, and I am going to talk about AI and global public health in terms of preventing harm. And I mean specifically preventing the harm of compounding social biases and equities in healthcare. I was asked to cut this talk to 10 minutes, so I'll be skipping a lot of the slides. Um, I am a medical doctor by training who's had some training in public health, um, and I've worked across various health systems. Um, however, I am also a researcher. Um, for the most part, I work with imaging, uh, radiological and other medical images. And while there is some overlap, that is not really the reason that I am here. Um, I will reveal a few things about myself personally that have informed my decision to um, stop and talk to you. I am a descendant of the African diaspora, um, transatlantic slave trade, who was raised in the United States. Um, and I'm also an adopted mother across nations and statelessness. So a lot of times I'll speak about these issues and I'll speak about black people and white people, but that's not really the point. That's sort of a shorthand for arbitrary social hierarchies, which are based on birth, descent, or innate characteristics. Um, well, in theory, we could all agree that these arbitrary hierarchies are unfair. There's a lot that goes on in society that maintains them, that perpetuates them. And I'm quite afraid that artificial intelligence algorithms are sometimes part of that. So, um, what I find really useful is to take the framework of social dominance theory, which um, comes out of social psycho psychology as one framework or lens that we can look at these problems through. In this um, theory, there are essentially dominating and dominated groups in society, and that's how we get these hierarchies. Um, part of the maintenance of these hierarchies can be legitimizing this. So I'll throw out a couple that are very common in healthcare. Women are hysterical whiners. There's really nothing wrong with them. They're not sick. They just like want to hear someone, you know, want to have someone hear them complain. Black people feel less pain, right? I mean, survey after survey of doctors in the U.S. up to this date shows that many even physicians believe in this myth and so forth. Um, so I'm quite afraid about what will happen uh, when AI um, compounds these problems in terms of differential um, treatment by the healthcare system. Uh, to, to be even more blunt about it, I will state the obvious. To me, AI and health seems mostly run by people who are out of touch with what for me are mundane realities. For me, as a person at the bottom of these hierarchies. And uh, one mundane reality I deal with or have dealt with is discriminatory care. Um, and I threw it up on this slide a few quotes uh, that surprised me to hear, but shouldn't have been surprising. Uh, a few times I've heard people in groups that work with medical AI say something like, oh, it was a real eye opener to see the statistics on who we were. And I thought, yeah, well, and you're 20 something white guys or you know, um, you, how did you not realize there were no women in your group? Um, but, you know, people are not even aware of these kinds of things necessarily. Um, another thing I heard that was really funny was, yeah, we did this, you know, big research, and it turns out that, you know, essentially across social classes, there's this disparity in data points. Yeah, that's totally obvious if you've ever been poor and lived in a poor neighborhood. Of course, there's a disparity in the data points people are generating. Um, so understanding who's actually at the decision-making level in AI, in healthcare, um, I understand why it is that people like me are often invisibilized to the algorithms at best. Um, um, I will skip some slides here about what AI is. Hopefully you've got a, a flavor of that at least already. Um, and I will get to the point 
of explaining why I would recommend a certain algorithm and the way we make these algorithms. What is very popular because it's easy to publish is algorithm of bias correction. You can come up with a lot of new algorithms to sort of fix the biases in your previously made algorithms and then you get papers and credits. But what I would actually recommend to anyone who actually wants to build um, one of these algorithms is to not get to that point. Um, because you become like a dog chasing its tail. Um, what is better, and I will try and explain why, is that you should have a team that is actually diverse in ways I will explain. You should use findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable data, reusable data and code, keeping the code as open as possible. You should curate and consider your data instead of just shoveling in raw data. Um, you should do adversarial testing in terms of not only um, the groups that people are in, but what correlate with those groups. And you should finally have some kind of constant surveillance on any algorithm you've actually deployed. So why fair and open? Because, well, medical AI failures are often not detected for a while. We've already seen them creating and perpetuating health inequities among millions, literally millions of people of my ethnicity in the U.S. alone. Um, and it, but it's not just people of my ethnicity. Um, specifically, it often is, um, and we, we need to understand that many of these algorithms were never created or never calibrated with all populations in mind. And when you can disaggregate the data in a way to see that, it becomes quite obvious. Um, there's a difference between marketing hype, like when people say, oh, um, we have this algorithm that detects melanoma better than doctors, and the reality. So specifically, Google Instruction 4 was an example of that. Their data set was basically a lot of Germans, um, German data sets. Um, that did not work out well for people with darker skin. Um, so one of the interesting thing about this is when you think about it, we don't want to disaggregate the data on race or ethnicity here. We want to actually go to the skin color. So you need good data and good metadata about your data. Um, here's another example of a... Um, a sort of biased model, but here you would want to disaggregate the data differently. Um, fundamentally, to uncover bias, although it, it will cost a lot of time and pain, you really need to anonymize your data sets or at least have great metadata about your data um, in such a way that it can be disaggregated. Um, so when you have an actually diverse team, you can sort of expect certain problems. Um, unfortunately, I've been to a lot of events about um, diversity in computer science, software engineering, et cetera, where they used a schema uh, to understand diversity that was based on national cultures and self-perceived gender. Notice how that almost perfectly outlines what's not the problem for something like me. My problem is not that I'm a U.S. and Israeli national, and it's not my self-perceived gender. Um, in the real world, um, what is often at play is where people are in a social hierarchy um, and a lot more complex variables. If we only think of diversity in terms of national cultures and self-perceived gender, what we get is some kind of um, group of elites who happen to have different national cultures. But that doesn't address one of the fundamental problems, um, which is that these algorithms can reinforce um, arbitrary and evil social hierarchies. Um, so if you, like me, have to work with these algorithms across many societies, um, there is a way to sort of make some guesses about who your algorithm might adversely affect. Um, you know, I've worked um, with algorithms in societies such as India that I have never been to, but, you know, with a little bit of research, I could quickly figure out that there were going to be some problems with a particular algorithm in the Dalit population. Um, if I had been in another country, the population would have been different. But across most countries, you can see there are different groups that have different life expectancies, different infant mortalities. Um, you can see there are groups where nativity disparities are actually upside down from what you would guess, even after they're unconfounded. So, for example, with Black people in the United States, there are certain disparities that are actually worse the longer you live in the U.S., even after unconfounded. Um, these groups have historically been targeted um, by eugenic and genocidal policies, and typically people pathologize very similar behaviors between them and the um, dominating group in very different ways. So, for example, um, right now I live in Europe. Uh, people are really um, excited about tiny houses, including the government, um, except the tiny houses that the Roma live in, which the government has been trying to run them out of for decades, claiming it's unhealthy. You know, same behavior, different response. Um, so, um, another issue is statelessness um, and migration, which can overlap or not these kinds of groups. Um, at the end of the day, you can also just look at who is included in the high prestige areas of medicine and decision roles in tech on average, right? And I shouldn't have to tell you that on average, these groups will be disincluded. And it's important to include them because, you know, when you are actually in one of these groups, you have a lot of information about um, what correlates with being in your group and a lot of inherent understanding about how algorithms uh, might interact with your group. So um, I just want to point out, this isn't only about obvious hierarchies like caste and race, financial class and gender, but we also need to think about hierarchies that we create in terms of things like languages um, and religion. This is confusing for Americans because people who are raised in the U.S. think of religion as a choice. I've lived in the Middle East. Religion is just kind of your ethnicity in a way. It's what your parents and grandparents and so on were. Um, you know, immigration status and also descent um, also uh, can be part of these social hierarchies. Um, so, you know, unfortunately, these things exist. And so therefore, we have to understand there's a difference in the world as it could have been if there were equality and the world as it is. We are taking data from the world as it is, and then we're taking data that's not even representative. And that becomes our raw data. So we need to think back through that process and curate our data accordingly. 
Um, and once we finally created our algorithm, what we need to do adversarial testing and that adversarial testing should not only be about changing one variable. It should be about looking at the variables that correlate with something like ethnicity, because those things like geography should also not be affecting how an algorithm. Um, looks at you in some cases, um, maybe it's relevant, but maybe it's not. We have to do really good adversarial testing to figure that out. Um, and finally, we need a surveillance. This isn't just about the idea of concept drift and data drift and heteroscedacity in general, right? Um, we need to realize that the hierarchies in society are real, but the way they're enforced are constantly changing. Um, and the boundaries between groups may change a little. Um, things like the geography of where these groups are located can sometimes change. Um, so basically, what I see as the most important role of public health is actually protecting us all from bad algorithms, which themselves, um, you know, may have bad health impacts for certain groups, but also getting rid of pointless algorithms, knowing when not to invest in artificial intelligence. And then finally, if there's time left over, protecting us all with good algorithms that I hope we can build as I've um, given some clues about. Thank you. Okay, my apologies for the uh, sound speed. Uh, uh, the next speaker is uh, Dr. Ravi Prakash. Uh, oh, he's there. <laughs> yeah. Hi, everybody. Yeah. Right, I'm going to share okay. my screen. Can everybody see this? Yes. Okay. And, and Dr. Jean, is it showing up in uh, the correct mode or in presenter mode? It's the correct mode. Okay, great. So okay. thanks everybody. My name is Ravi Parikh. I am a oncologist and I direct a lab at the University of Pennsylvania called the Human Algorithm Collaboration Lab, which largely focuses on clinical implementation of machine learning and artificial intelligence based tools. Um, I'm excited to present uh, some emerging research uh, on inequity and risk prediction, examining and mitigating racial bias in the Veterans Affairs Care Assessment Needs Model or CAN model. I want to acknowledge uh, my disclosures and acknowledge that this work was funded by organizations, including the VA, HSRND, um, and the Commonwealth Fund. I also just want to make sure to acknowledge our broad team, which has been working on this for uh, over two years um, on studying bias and operational clinical risk models. So um, as, as many of my uh, prior speakers have shown, uh, inequity and risk uh, algorithms is an expansive societal problem. We've largely tried to tackle that um, with operational mortality and um, uh, hospitalization risk prediction models that are used in public policy and clinical operations. For example, during the COVID pandemic, we argued that algorithms that were used to adjudicate um, resource allocation for vaccines were potentially a reinforcing bias. This was an op-ed in the New York Times. We've also argued that the bias, uh, that the pandemic uh, related uh, concept shifts and drifts may have perpetuated and expanded bias in commonly used algorithms. And we've put out some papers to this effect. And of course, we know that fairness is an issue in uh, algorithms outside of healthcare as well, such as criminal justice. Um, so many, much prior work has raised concerns about algorithmic unfairness. However, describing some of the mechanisms of that unfairness and trying to mitigate it has been a less well-studied area. In this research, we study mortality risk prediction. Um, and we study this for a variety of reasons. One, because uh, it, mortality risk tools are used for risk stratification across a variety of industries, life insurers, health insurers, allocation of scores to resources, both in and outside of healthcare, and risk adjustments of payments or performance in healthcare fields, which is a particular interest in our health policy-related research. In particular, for this uh, talk, we study the CAN score, which is a VA-based uh, score developed in 2010, used to proactively identify veterans at high risk for poor outcomes and to allocate resources such as palliative care specialists. Um, based on administrative data for over 5 million veterans, the CAN score is uh, used uh, by uh, primary care clinicians and is viewed over 10,000 times monthly across the VA and it's expressed in terms of a percentile rank. Our questions in this project were to identify whether the VA's one-year mortality CAN score was inequitable towards Black veterans, which are um, well represented in the VA population, and to identify mechanisms of this inequity and to see whether they could be mitigated. 
So our sample characteristics for this study, which studied uh, the CAN score over a four-year period, involved over 5 million individuals, 4 million white veterans and 1 million black veterans approximately. Um, you can see that just on first glance, the mortality rate, um, the one-year mortality rate, which is what the CAN score predicts, uh, is slightly higher for white veterans, um, but also the CAN score uh, on a percentile basis is higher for white veterans. So on first glance, you might say, well, higher mortality, higher risk score, is this really evidence of unfairness? But of course, you know, we need to dig into the details a bit. So we studied two definitions of fairness in this, uh, to identify unfairness in this project. One is a definition called demographic parity, which looks at the distribution of risk scores across the population. And when we look at this, we can see that the CAN score appears to classify more veterans as high risk and thus be unfair. Um, as you can see, the distribution is left shifted for black veterans, um, such that uh, while about 30% of white veterans qualify as high risk using a commonly used score threshold of 75, only about 17% of black veterans qualify as high risk. However, uh, definitions of fairness such as this don't take into account actual underlying risk between populations, and so demographic parity may not be the best definition to focus on here. So we also study another definition called equality of opportunity, which actually looks at resource allocation and may be a more operationally relevant definition of fairness. So here we study false negative rates, or the proportion of high-risk individuals that are not identified by the algorithm since we feel like this is the big problem with resource allocation uh, in fairness questions. And so among individuals who die, we can see that Black veterans are systematically under-identified by this mortality risk prediction algorithm to a tune of about 10 to 11 absolute percentage points. And that's across all spectrums of risk threshold. So uh, not only through demographic parity, but also equality of opportunity, we see evidence of unfairness. However, we need to look into the actual mechanisms here. So when you look at the actual features of the CAN score, which are too, too much to sort of um, uh, go into in this uh, uh, talk, many of them focus on comorbidities. And so it seems natural to think about whether comorbidities um, and, and differences in distributions of comorbidities may be a mechanism for this systematic under-identification. However, when you look across the age spectrum, Black veterans tend to have higher comorbidities um, compared to white veterans. And this is not a VA specific problem. This has been shown in commercially insured and Medicare settings as well. So it seems unlikely that high comorbidity burden is the mechanism here since, you know, if it was a primarily comorbidity dominant score, you might expect it would be higher for black veterans um, and, and correctly identify them. But we actually uh, hypothesized after looking at the distribution, this is the same table I forwarded you before, that age may be a mechanism of unfairness. And you can see here clearly that black veterans at the VA tend to be younger than white veterans. And so when you look at the actual weights that are assigned in the CAN score, this has big implications because age has a high weight for mortality risk prediction. You can see here that uh, the distribution of age appears to be similar uh, to the distribution of CAN scores and that it is left shifted for black veterans. Black veterans tend to be much younger than white veterans. And they die younger as well. So even when looking at the outcome, black veterans tend to die younger than white veterans. And so you start to see here why age may be a mechanism because it looks like black individuals are accumulating mortality risk at younger ages. Now as to the mechanism for why that might be, that uh, I think has less to do with comorbidities and more to do with weathering, a so-called weathering effect or accumulation of adverse socioeconomic factors at younger ages for black individuals. And that's not necessarily specific to the VA. We also explore and, and uh, try to investigate statistical mechanisms to actually mitigate inequity in the CAN score. And so we used a few quite common uh, techniques to try to mitigate um, uh, bias. Um, you can see the, on the x-axis uh, here are, um, uh, on the, oh, sorry, apologies. Um, so on the x-axis here, you can see um, the false negative rate in percentages between Black individuals indicated in squares and white individuals indicated in, uh, in uh, blue circles. 
And then uh, several common techniques that are used in uh, mortality risk or in uh, risk prediction algorithms to try to account for fairness, including so-called in-process methods like weighting interaction terms and penalization. And then a technique that we developed that's actually a pre-process tool called normalization, which tries to normalize race-specific effects on age out of the more of the CAN score and essentially what we call de-race the age variable in uh, in the CAN score. And you can see that this pre-process method of normaliz normalizing age out of the risk score actually results in the largest mitigation in false negative rate gaps while actually not act, uh, compromising accuracy and um, uh, measured by AUC as much in the risk score. So this is a promising method that we're taking to other investigations of fairness that we're looking at. What is the impact of a fair CAN score? Well, when we used a normalized age variable, when we look at the specific use case of allocating palliative care resources for individuals with high mortality risk, we can see that using a, assuming a fixed uh, distribution of palliative care scores, the percentage of people who die who receive palliative care, if we use the threshold-based referral system for palliative care, would increase significantly for Black individuals across all thresholds, while not necessarily significantly decreasing white referrals to palliative care. So this could be an important for risk allocation. So in conclusion, uh, we find that um, the mechanism for unfairness in the mortality can score is related to a differential age mortality relationship for Black individuals. We were able to apply a normalization approach that mitigated this inequity. Um, and what's important is that we've been able to replicate this mechanism in work that I'm not showing here today in populations such as Medicare beneficiaries and are actively working with groups like the VA to test approaches to mitigate inequity in the CAN score. So thanks very much, and I encourage you to visit our lab's website to explore some more of our work in this, in this domain. Thank you, Ravi. Uh, please stay for the question and answer section. Okay, next, uh, I will play the recorded video from Joy Wan at Purdue University, and she is also <laughs> Hello, my name is Xiaotian Wang. I'm very happy to be here today to introduce our work in terms of explainable and fair machine learning. So nowadays, machine learning and artificial intelligence, they are literally everywhere. Despite the great success of these powerful tools, there are some concerns remaining, and one of the major concerns is fairness concerns in machine learning. So when we apply these powerful tools in practice, in global health and other high stake areas, we see that the model are treating people from different demographics differently. And uh, such discrimination against the race, age of, of groups is causing more and more tension and concerns in applying the models in practice. So in order to address these fairness concerns, uh, one of the questions we'd like to answer is why the model is making such bias predictions. In other words, what is going on in the model prediction? So in order to address this, one way we can do is to explain the model behavior. So here we use an image classification as an example to clarify what explanation means in machine learning. So for a black box model, it takes image as input and provides the prediction in terms of the action, saying what the people are doing in the image. As for explanation, they are provided in terms of heat maps, showing the highlighted regions where the model are focusing on to make such predictions. So such explanation provide better understanding for end users, showing what the model are doing when making such predictions. And also based on the explanation, we can understand better why the model makes bias prediction. So still for the action uh, classification test, we can see if we build different models, the model may have different behaviors. For here, if we compare two models, we can see both models have uh, the correct prediction for both for all the images, meaning that in terms of accuracy, two, the two models are similar. But if we take, that to take a look at the explanations, they are very different. Model 1 is mainly focusing on the facial regions that are highly correlated with gender, but Model 2 is more focused on the regions that are more related to the action itself, meaning that 
for model one. Despite that, it has crop prediction for the images. Model one actually has gender bias. Also, such explanation help us understand that the model makes bias prediction because it uses the bias information. So in order to address this bias prediction, uh, here I'd like to introduce some solutions we propose to improve fairness in machine learning. I'd like to summarize our work in terms of two parts, and let's start with part one, addressing bias. In order to understand how to address bias in machine learning, let's first take a review of the procedure of building a model for a prediction. So roughly speaking, it involves three steps. Uh, first one is we collect a bunch of training data, and step two is we build a machine learning model to fit the training data, and step three is to make prediction or inference based on the trend model. And correspondingly, in order to address bias, we can take operation on all those three perspectives, which are pre-processing, in-processing, and post-processing. Pre-processing means operate on the data such that we can clean the data and make the data to be more fair. And uh, for in-processing, it means work on the model such that we can impose some fairness constraints to the model such that the model can have more fair performance. And for post-processing, it means adjust the final prediction of the model such that the final prediction is more fair. And uh, in the next, we will first introduce solutions from the pre-processing and post-processing perspective. And in the end, we will propose a solution in terms of in-processing. Okay. So let's start with pre-processing. So pre-processing is working on the data. The reason we work on data to address machine learning bias is because most of the time, model bias is coming from data bias. And uh, in data bias, one of the major resources is imbalanced data or underrepresentation, meaning that when we collect the training data for uh, building the model, if the model cannot see enough number of samples in a certain demographic group, then it's very likely the model will have worse performance towards that dem demographic group. In order to address this, what we do is to use a generative model for cross-domain translation, such that we can build a synthetic data with perfectly balanced data across all demographic groups. And we observe that if we use this perfectly balanced synthetic data to build a model, the, this build model will have improved fairness. So this is pre-processing for addressing bias. And next is post-processing. Post-processing means adjusting the final prediction. And based on our preliminary analysis, we can see that for conventional methods, they have some intrinsic bias in terms of the prediction. So here is a case where positive labels are favorable labels. For example, where positive labels meaning the allocation of a certain type of healthcare resource. And uh, for conventional machine learning models, they are likely to have more positive predictions for a privileged group, while more negative predictions for unprivileged groups, or which is a type of intrinsic bias in terms of the distribution of the predicted outcome. So in order to address such intrinsic bias, what we propose to do is to decrease the cutting threshold for samples in the unprivileged group for classification, while increase the cutting threshold for samples in the privileged group. And such group aware threshold can help us address the intrinsic bias in the model prediction and also better trade off the fairness and accuracy in classification. We also provided a theoretical results showing that our model can have better near optimality results, which provide a guarantee for better performance and fairness of the model we built. So this is part one for addressing bias. As we can see, when we address bias for the previous methods and actually for uh, most of the fairness methods, we usually require access to the demographic information. Demographic information means uh, age, race, uh, gender information of, of the participants. However, in practice, due to privacy, legal, or regulatory constraints, it's often invisible to, uh, invisible to collect such information, which greatly limit the usage of conventional methods. 
And also in practice, when we build a model for fairness, we usually expect the model to be fair across multiple demographic attributes. However, if a model is specific for one certain type of fairness, it does not guarantee fair behavior in other demographics. For example, if we build a model specifically for addressing age bias, then the model is not guaranteed to be fair for people from different race groups. In order to address this, here we propose to do fairness without demographics, meaning that the model does not get access to the demographic information of any participant while we want the model to have fair behavior. So in classification, the solution we propose is label smoothing. So label smoothing means instead of using the binary labels, which are zero and one, uh, we propose to use soft labels, which are continuous values between zero and one. And this continuous value shows how hard or how easy the sample is to be classified. And based on the preliminary results, we see that by using the soft labels, the last two rows are results from the soft labels. We can get better results in terms of two commonly used fairness metrics. One is disparity impact, the other is equalized odds. For both two metrics, the lower the value is, it means better results. Uh, and then we can see compared with the model using binary labels, we get lower values for both of these two metrics by using the soft label, showing that label smoothing is helpful to improve fairness. Motivated by this, we use knowledge desolation to first build a teacher model to learn such soft label, and then we build a student model to learn from such soft label, such that the student model can get improved fairness. And then we can also interpret this from the perspective of sample reweighing, which is an in-processing method, and shows that the reason our model is successful in improving fairness is because it correctly assigned higher weights for higher samples in classification. We also have some theoretical uh, guarantee showing that the model is able to improve fairness in theoretical analysis. So that's all for today. Thank you all. This is a quite different perspective compared to other talks. Thank you. Uh, please stay for the question and answer in about 15 minutes. So next, I will play the video from uh, Serena Jinchun Gu from Florida University. Uh, I don't see her picture. Uh, she's there. I saw her. I, uh, uh, yeah. OK, so I'm going to play her video. Good afternoon. I'm Serena Guo, an assistant professor in the Department of Pharmaceutical Outcomes and Policy at the University of Florida. I'm very excited to have the opportunity to share our research at the Fairness in Machine Intelligence for Global Health Workshop. My presentation is Fairness and Bias in Machine Learning from Assessment to Mitigation. In the next 10 minutes, I'm going to first discuss the public health implications of fairness and bias in the AI machine learning. And then uh, there will be a brief overview of our going work in the field through a case study. How can we measure bias, identify underlying causes, and uh, uh, apply different approaches to mitigate identified bias? So what does fairness mean for AI machine learning? When we talk about the fairness of a machine learning algorithm, what we really care about is the impact of on uh, health equity. Specifically, the question would be whether the machine learning model create or exacerbate inequities related to age, sex, race, ethnicity, or other protected uh, characteristics. In terms of bias in real-world applications of machine learning. 
we concern whether the model may lead a decision that systematically less favorable to individuals of the disadvantaged group. Um, consequently, best algorithms can lead to decisions which can have a collective disparate impact on certain group of people that's worsening inequities. That's why we care so much about the fairness and the bias of machine learning algorithms. This is a famous example of uh, algorithmic bias. Uh, the compass uh, recidivism algorithm um, was applied in many justice systems in the U.S. However, with using this algorithm, black defendants were more likely to be indirect, uh, incorrectly, correctively judged to be at higher risk of recidivism than white defendants. For our group, our ongoing work includes quantifying bias, identifying underlying causes, and uh, develop and apply different approaches to mitigate bias. So the, regarding measuring bias, the most commonly used metrics uh, uh, algorithmic errors for negatives and for positives are measured to um, two major classifications of prediction errors. We need to make a human decision on which one is our focus because FNR and FPR are mathematically inversely related. There would not be a ideal algorithm can have many more, both of FNR and FPR. If an algorithm predicts adversary outcomes that um, and the following intervention are beneficial and preventive, we want to evaluate for negative rate. On the other hand, uh, if algorithm predict a beneficial outcome and the following intervention might be punitive and harmful, then we would want to focus on for positive rate. Uh, regarding understanding the causes of bias, first of course, we have to have a understanding whether the data is truly representative of the targeted population. On the top of that, as machine learning practitioners, we always want to pursue a more quantitative perspective um, to understand the underlying causes. Actually, our group have developed a causal decomposition methods that can quantify causal paths leading to bias and the disparities of machine learning models. Uh, regarding bias mitigation, it can be addressed at different stages of model development. In the pre-model uh, development stage, we may consider rebating and resampling um, the samples to address the under or over representativeness of protected group. During the model development stage, bias mitigation solutions include removing the sensitive attributes, considering accuracy bias trade-off in the model selections and uh, applying for penalized parameters such as adversarial learning. We may also consider post hoc adjustment for risk score uh, device. Um, and the next few slides, I will quickly go through one of our studies. Um, we developed a machine learning model to predict the opioid overdose and then conducted a serious experiment to overcome challenges and the barriers for rural implementation. Uh, I will um, address how we uh, evaluate bias and uh, mitigate the identified bias of this algorithm. So a little bit background information of our algorithm. We use the Florida insurance claims data to develop a model to predict the opioid opioid overdose. Um, and the model has been uh, internally, uh, externally validated and performed consistently well. So um, in the evaluation of racial bias, uh, because our outcome is opioid overdose and it's an adversary clinical outcomes, our primary focus of bias measurement is for negative rate. On the left graph, the x-axis is a predicted opioid risk score, um, and the y-axis is for negative rate. The 
yellow line stands for white individual, purple line stands for black individual. So um, with using this uh, opioid prediction um, model, 34% uh, of white patients uh, who actually had opioid overdose were misclassified as low risk, while 65% black patients uh, were misclassified as low risk. That means high risk of black people were about twice more likely to be misclassified low risk compared to white people. It clearly had racial bias of the current form of um, machine learning model to predict opioid overdose. Then we applied three different approaches to mitigate the identified racial bias. First, uh, we tried adversarial learning. After applying adversary learning, uh, the prediction ability slightly decreased, uh, while the bias um, had minimal change. So we used the ratio of FNR for negative rate in black over white individuals as a bias measure uh, for the original GBM model, it was 1.9, and after applying for the adversary learning, it's 1.8, it's very similar. So then we tried the second approach that uh, removed the race from the model, which was our sensitive attribute. After removing the race, we find for both GBM and LASO, they showed similar pattern. The prediction utility slightly decreased. At the same time, the bias significantly improved from originally about 1.9 decreased to um, 1.3. So uh, a third approach we tried was a post hoc risk adjustment. After selecting a uh, different risk cutoff for black patients, uh, we achieved a balanced error rate regarding the first negative rate and the first positive rate, actually. Um, the numbers seem similar now, but a bigger question is that from ICO perspective, was a consequence if we place different risk cutoffs with different subgroups in reward implementation of a machine learning algorithm. Okay, takeaway message one. This slide demonstrates the paradigm shifting from one dimension focus to two dimension focus in the development of machine learning model with the goal of not only making accurate but also equitable prediction. Takeaway message two. We've talked about the methods and the approaches, but our focus should be making uh, should not be making machine learning model fair, but rather uh, should be focusing on making the overall system and the outcomes fair. That's it. Thank you very much. Okay, that is a very interesting conclusion. Uh, so. It's now the question and the answer uh, part. And so there are some questions in the chat window. Uh, the first one is asked by Dr. Dong Xiaohu to uh, Xiao Chen. <laughs> Maybe you can answer it. Yeah, yeah sure. hi. Yeah, okay. do I need to rephrase? Yeah, hi. Uh... Yeah, this is Dong Jiao from uh, uh, Dong Jiao Zhu from computer, uh, computer Science at Penn State University. Uh, I enjoyed all the talk today. Uh, uh, particularly, I, my question regarding the uh, the connection of the group fairness and the individual fairness uh, for uh, Dr. Xiao Chen, uh, Wang. Thank you, Dr. Ju, for the great question. Uh, so for individual fairness and group fairness, there are more like two perspectives for measuring fairness. For group fairness, we want to make sure the model is having similar behavior among different demographic groups. Uh, while for individual fairness is to make sure the model is having like similar performance for similar individuals. Uh, and uh, uh, as for the specific question where like label smoothing approach, the connection between that versus the individual fairness, uh, I would like to answer that from two folds. 
Uh, the first one is uh, label smoothing. We actually build a connection with our proposed method with the method of reweighting. Uh, so it's like then the question is more like to ask the connection between reweighting methods versus individual fairness. Uh, so uh, as far as I know, there's uh, not like direct connection between those two because for individual fairness, uh, most of the methods are focusing on like more like from the Lipschitz constraint perspective, so that to uh, regulate uh, on the models this perspective, so that they can have individual fairness. And the second fold I of my thought is uh, for the connection, but but there's still no like study showing there's any conflict between group fairness versus individual fairness. So for addressing individual fairness, I think it will be a nice direction to explore like the connection between the group and individual. And uh, uh, my thoughts is like the more obvious connection will be probably on the pre-processing side or the post-processing side, like the two uh, methods I introduced in the beginning. Uh, pre-processing side is more like when we generate counterfactual data and the counterfactual data is something related with individual fairness. See, if we have flipped sensitive, uh, sensitive information, then the model should still have uh, similar performance or prediction for that. As for post-processing, what we can do is uh, if we can somehow connect the uh, individual and group fairness metric, and then what we can do is to adjust the post hoc by cutting threshold for them, then it's possible to connect the group fairness methods with uh, individual fairness by adjusting the prediction threshold, uh, like making post-processing for them. So that's my two things. Thank you. Okay. okay. Uh, we also have a question asked from one speaker to another speaker. <laughs> so, uh, Ravi, would you like to answer uh, the question posed by uh, Candice? <laughs> and this. Yeah. Sure. Uh, so the, the question was about uh, whether there may be sort of a U-shaped curve of weathering for Black veterans because higher socioeconomic status may bring Black veterans into more contact with experiences uh, of prejudice, which may also be related to, to weathering. Um, so uh, part of the issue with examining sort of empirically the weathering hypothesis is that for populations, there's very limited collection of um, socioeconomic features at the individual level. That's why normally for you know, um, population level risk prediction, oftentimes we're, laying, we're relying on imperfect surrogates for socioeconomic status, like area level metrics or metrics from ICD diagnoses, which are just very poor at, at coding socioeconomic status related features. So um, I think that needs to improve. From the availability of data, we haven't seen a U-shaped feature, but we've been able to see that um, black veterans tend to accumulate adverse socioeconomic features, um, including, um, you know, poor transportation status or housing instability at younger ages than white individuals. Um, and so that sort of lends credence to the weathering hypothesis, but I think there would need to be some um, sort of uh, population level collection of, of socioeconomic features in a way that sort of addresses some of the biases of missingness that we see. Thank you. Uh, there is a question in the chat. I don't know uh, who is addressed to, and it's say, talk about the precise the algorithm used. Uh, I'm not sure what that question is uh, addressed to. Uh, uh, there is another question posed by uh, to uh, Xiao Chen Wang. Um, uh, yeah, sure. Uh, thank you, Dr. Jun, for the question. Uh, so the question is uh, is regarding the post hoc explanation to identify bias in the image classification system. Uh, and uh, your point is uh, totally correct. So it would not be scalable because the explanation methods that I propose is for each individual sample, meaning that if we have millions of samples, then we need to run the explanation method millions of times for, for all of them, then it will not be scalable. Uh, so the question is how do we uh, make the system to be more scalable and automated for identification of bias? Uh, so several thoughts will be like this. The first one is uh, uh, the explanation methods I propose, they are more like on the individual level. 
Uh, so it's like we get different explanation for different samples. So it's like for different participants or different data samples, we get different explanations. But uh, one common thing we can do is we get the global explanation is that the global explanation means we get one explanation for all the samples. Then that way, the explanation size will be dependent on the number of features rather than the number of participants or samples. Then that might be a way for uh, like higher, larger scale, larger scale here, we focus on like larger number of samples. Uh, that's one thing. The other thing is uh, if we talk about automated identification of bias, uh, so it's like the purpose of identifying bias, my understanding is we want to identify that since we want to you know, address the bias. So the other way around will be if we can impose some constraint or impose some regularization onto the model. Instead of doing identification, but we impose some regularization on the model, saying that when the model is making the prediction, it should have some, maybe it should not focus on the like uh, demographic information, uh, maybe age, race, or gender related area of this uh, type of information, then that will be a way to even go beyond the identification, but to use uh, like prior knowledge or regularization to address bias. So my thoughts is like that will be probably the ultimate goal to use explanation to address bias. Hopefully this answers your question. Yes, it does. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, I want to bring everyone's attention. There is a student from Uganda is asking for people to mentor uh, uh, <laughs> for doing machine learning. Uh, I guess you can reach out. <laughs> or we can try to connect. Uh, please send a, I guess send your resume or relevant work. I, we can distribute in the participant is to who is willing uh are available or share similar interests uh, so uh, that's certainly uh something i haven't <laughs> uh, thought about so it's, it's a good platform we, we have so, uh uh more questions so um yeah, I have a question. Uh, Delhi Walveda Biza is you asked about precise algorithms. Um, I wonder if what you're getting at is that there are some algorithms that, in terms of explainable AI, are explainable post hoc, and then some that are intrinsically explainable, like a logistic um, regression or linear regression or a decision tree. Versus, is, is that your question? Because uh, it's really, I. I'm wondering if that's what you're getting at or something else. Uh, I'm not sure that person is uh, responding or not. Uh, Andrea, I, I see you turn your camera on. Uh, yeah, there are questions uh, or comments? You are muted, by the way. Yeah. Oh, I'm not sure whether you can unmute as well. Oh. You are still muted. Uh. Can, can you? Hello, hello. Oh, yeah, yeah, okay. okay. <laughs> Um, I, 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 I had to, to leave for a moment because there was uh, uh, someone <laughs> meeting, I uh, had to meet someone, but um, so I, I think the, with relation to the, to the bias in these, in these models, I, I found the work from, um, you know, when, when Ravi was uh, presenting about these different factors that, that uh, you observe explaining these, these biases, that, that's, that's all from the uh, all of that is specific to the CAN model, and we we could apply these to to other similar risk prediction models. Yeah, so um, I think what you're referring to is uh, um, the when we were examining different factors or contributors to the CAN score. So 
Um, we have, um, in similar work, looked at um, other mortality risk prediction mm. scores that have been used in, in uh, policy and research. For example, um, one score in Medicare called the Hierarchical Conditions Category Score is used for risk adjustment um, and has a mortality risk prediction score. Um, and we've also seen similar factors in that age is a potential mechanism for uh, unfairness um, in comparison to other comorbidity and um, utilization-based factors, which I think is interesting. Um, and then we've we've looked at um, the Alex Hauser comorbidity score, which is a you know a commonly used for risk adjustment and research, and found similar findings. Mm -hmm. The um, you know some of these the the, the, the age-related mechanism may be specific to mortality risk prediction, or, or I, I would say is magnified in mortality risk prediction scores because um, for scores like, for example, hospitalization prediction, much of those scores place higher weights on comorbidities and utilization related factors. And so there's still some evidence of unfairness, but it may not be that age is driving that. But one thing we felt was that our our pre-processing technique of normalization, um, you know, essentially regressing race out of a potentially problematic variable or a variable that may contribute to fairness is a generalizable mechanism across different scores. And so that's sort of a, a topic of ongoing uh, work. And I, I will look at some of your papers on, on, on I, I can find out on, on the website, right? On the um, your lab. On the groups. Yeah, yeah, website. yeah. I'll I'll put the website. If you can put okay, or maybe a couple. Of, what would be the most relevant references to to look into those methods in more detail? Sure. You have, yeah. Okay, if you could share one, some of those, would be great. Sure. Thank you. Uh, there's a question in the chat about the uh, how can we di differentiate between measurement error, inaccuracy, and biases in the data. This seems to be a conceptual question, and so I guess the, anyone of the speaker can can share their experience or uh, view on this. So. Yes, okay, I can yeah share some perspective from our algorithm predicting the opioid overdose. So we used the um, Pennsylvania and the Florida claims uh, Medicaid claims data to predict the. Uh, um, Opioid, opioid overdose the outcome was identified using medical claims, uh, ICD codes, and uh, there's an issue that uh, we found um, partially uh, the racial bias we identified is associated with the um, um, for black patients they are uh, less likely to pursue or seek medical attention after a drug overdose, you can count it as a measurement issue that uh, because the nature of the data, uh, it's an administrative health claims data, we couldn't uh, capture those uh, opioid overdose that was not documented in those type of data. And on the other hand, it's also a more fun, um, uh, broader um, perspective is also a bias, a systematic bias, because for all sorts of reasons, uh, some of the related to culture, some of related to the um, under and medical like, insurance, and uh, those uh, those socioeconomically um, more disadvantaged and uh, some racial ethnic uh, minority groups, so they just. Uh, um, less likely to pursue the uh, uh, seek medical attention. So I think, yeah, it contributes both sides, the environment issue and uh, the um, bias issue. It's uh, dependent on how you um, explain in the underlying mechanism of the data and the problem. There is a hand raised. Uh... Yeah, yeah. Uh, my name is Dr. Para. Thank you so much for this outstanding uh, presentation. I wanted to just build on the thoughts of the last uh, presenter who was com commenting on uh, 
it, trying to explain underlying mechanisms for um, health seeking behaviors for minoritized, uh, marginalized, and uh, disenfranchised groups. And another important reason to name why uh, folks uh, from, from these groups, from marginalized groups, um, uh, may not have as robust health seeking behaviors uh, because of the experiences of discrimination in these, in these healthcare uh, settings. Um, and the second piece as well is the role of criminal justice system also in these um, in these same settings and the concern uh, because of the uh, stereotyping of uh, for criminality that exists in our systems that have inherent um, biases but also discrimination because again bias at least from um, a socio sociological standpoint um, speaking of bias not necessarily the machine learning standpoint but from a sociological standpoint thinking speaking of bias we have found is not necessarily the problem as much as discrimination, which is the behavior that is uh, affixed to the, the attitude of bias. And so uh, the experiences of discrimination that are built on the bias that marginalized people experience in healthcare settings and the ways that it intersects with the criminal justice system is also a powerful reason for why those health seeking behaviors may not be as robust and need to be taken into consideration when we look at processes as far as machine learning is concerned, as one of the speakers has spoken about earlier. So I just thought that that would be an important perspective to add to the mix because um, it does color and inform um, the ways that we use the uh, machine learning or interpret the, um, the AI uh, processes. Thank you for that comment. Uh, uh, any of the speakers would like to follow up on that? Uh Hi, uh, this is Reva um, from okay. NIST. Hey, yeah, and on 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 top of that uh, excellent uh, description of of why certain demographic groups are not um, engaging in certain types of behaviors, um, so that does kind of lend itself into um, the the three part type of uh, the the taxonomy of bias that we uh, published last year here at NIST and. The role of system. So that's a systemic bias, and that um, continues to. So it's not one time, right? It's this ongoing thing, and it interacts with human biases. So um, whether people perceive themselves to be at risk uh, if they were to submit a claim because of systemic bias. And then we have it all captured in the data and the models, which gets to this. And we describe that whole thing as this pernicious mixture. So I think the uh, big takeaway here. Um, from which was a great point made on, at the very last presentation, is that this is not um, the data and the models that we need to be concerning with, but more the outcomes and trying to build fair outcomes that is much more complex than just focusing on the model. Thank you, Reva, for the follow-up. We, we have a, uh, another question in the chat uh, is about uh, what should the role of medical and public health faculty regarding AI and also the role of AI in training. And what will be the role of medical and public health students regarding AI and the role of AI in learning? And there's a comment that says there's the National Artificial Intelligence Initiative Act also related to the health workforce. Uh, and and maybe some of the speaker can comment on this. But, uh, Ravi, maybe you, you are more, <laughs> you, you seem to have a direct experience of this. <laughs> so, yeah. Uh, yeah, so um, I mean, I think that there is going to be a need for um, clinicians to become familiar with AI, uh, partic you know, particularly in the field of decision support and even how to sort of correctly use, you know, things like chat GPT for, you know, accurate scientific writing and the like, because I think that's just going to be inherent in what we do with scientific writing and shouldn't be something that we ignore. Um, you know, but I, I, I sort of see it the same way that we get trained to use the electronic health record as it's just going to be 
inherent in our practice of medicine, but isn't necessarily going to change the underlying clinical competencies that we have to do. So, you know, I, I, I think it's, I would argue it's more of a technical skill than a, than a, a fundamentally core clinical skill that we as healthcare practitioners are going to need to uptake. But that's just in my opinion. Uh, Candice, uh, you also have your perspective, I know, yeah. Yeah, um, so it's interesting. Um, I would argue that if you're familiar with the field of radiology, there's maybe a metaphor to be made between the way radiologists understand physics. They're not physicists, right? But they know when something's going on with their machine. And perhaps one of the ways physicians should learn to understand AI systems, right? They don't have to be AI experts. They don't have to, you know, put images in dockers and all this weird technical stuff I spend a lot of time doing, but they need to understand maybe something about how some things can go wrong in these systems. And as I said in my presentation, um, I think one of the fundamental roles of public health actually should be protecting us all from bad algorithms because these things have a compounding effect with the problems of, of social bias in the system already. I really agree with the person who said that, you know, we have to understand the health seeking behaviors of marginalized communities because my fear is that because of the way AI can sort of bake in and propagate uh, these biases, we can actually make things worse. Um, so I think a big role for public health is actually protecting um, us all in general from uh, bad algorithms. And just one more note about this. Um, you know, I, I've interacted with a lot of public health people and AI is such a, such a fancy buzzword. They don't realize that even though they may code in VBA on an Excel spreadsheet, they're already using some of these algorithms, right? I mean, it's just like very primitive because they work in Excel, but you know, they perfectly understand what a linear regression is. They might not be able to code a lasso like I can, but they, they can do something. And um, I think we need to move away from thinking of AI as something that's super technical, um, you know, and have people understand that the concepts are actually um, fairly simple and accessible if you work in a field like public health. And you're already very familiar um, with how these things work in many cases. So I hope public health will sort of step up its game in, in protecting us. Okay, this is a great segue for the uh, next panel discussion. That would be moderated by Dr. Uh, Wan Di Dean from the Middle Tennessee State University. And, uh, and the panelists will be uh, Dr. Rebecca Hua from NSF, Leila from the York University, Dong Xiao Zhu from Wayne State, and Crystal uh, also from York University. So, uh, Wan Di, it's yours. Okay, thank you. So uh, after we enjoy the great talks, uh, we move on to the first panel. It's about algorithm, worldview, and fairness of AI for global health. So let me first introduce uh, briefly uh, about our four panelists. Uh, Rebecca Wa, she's a, a program director from National Science Foundation. Also, she is the uh, computational linguistics from the uh, University of uh, Pittsburgh. Uh, Leila Siyer Talantri, uh, she's from the uh, Department of uh, Electrical Engineering and Computer Science at uh, York New University. Her uh, research include responsible AI and fairness of uh, AI model. Uh, Dong Xiaoju uh, is from the uh, Department of uh, Computer Science at Wayne State University. He is the founding director of a Wayne AI Research Initiative and director of the Trustworthy AI Lab. Finally, we have uh, Crystal Elmore. Uh, he's uh, associate professor from health informatics at York University. And his research subscribes in an equity informatics, so social justice perspective. So uh, it's my honor and pleasure to welcome the four uh, first panel. Uh, the first question, how do different disciplines and backgrounds shape perspectives on AI and machine learning system and fairness in the health. So I also uh, put on the uh, chat for everybody to see. 
how do different disciplines and background uh, shape perspective on the uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning systems and fairness in health? Uh, who would like to start uh, to make some comments? There is a hand raised. Oh, 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 please, Dr. Wa, please. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I really enjoyed uh, listening to the presentations uh, the, the hour before. And I think to some, some extent, a lot of the views are already expressed in a lot of the presentations. I can see very different perspectives showing up. And so I think that's a, start, a good starting point. And I'm actually very interested to hear how the different presenters um, saw how different other people presented similar sorts of problems. So say if you're a clinician and you hear a computer scientist talk about um, um, how they perceive the problems of fairness, um, does that does that resonate with you in some ways? Um, or do you feel like it's a little bit abstract? And then uh, conversely for computer scientists, when you hear clinicians talk about a fairness, do you, do you kind of want to know more about the, the, the domain specific knowledge? I mean, so I come from a computer science background uh, with relatively little exposure to health issues. And so I'm very curious to know, you know, some of the pitfalls um, that was presented earlier, kind of a systemic problem. And, and so I think those are really interesting for us to think about. Um, and I'm just curious how other people feel about it. Thanks. Thank you. Is Crystal or Leila or Dongxiao want to? Oh, please, Crystal, please. Just uh, I want to mention that uh, how important is uh, multidisciplinary uh, work uh, in this field. So I, I my background is biomedical engineering and computer science. So I, I've worked, for example, uh, for like now two years with uh, someone in critical disability, a researcher, a colleague in critical disabilities and uh, to build a, a search engine uh, uh, looking into data related to people with disabilities and the way we uh, we uh, we approach the problem is completely different if we are in from a computer science background or from a social studies or uh, uh, people with disabilities critical disabilities background so for example maybe we can uh, search for for a uh, blindness let's say uh, using the search engine while people in critical disabilities, they look at uh, uh, accommodation instead of blindness because uh, the, the, way, the way they view disabilities and the way uh, none really researchers in the field view disability is different. So there is a medical model where, where people think about uh, what is lacking in, uh, uh, in others uh, in terms of, let's say, blindness or deafness or so. And there is a, a social model for people with disabilities, for disabilities, social model look at what kind of accommodation the society presents for people with disabilities or does not present for people with disabilities. So, so the way then uh, we, we code and uh, we present the information and uh, and uh, the search engine look at for information is completely different. And I think that to to for the fairness and, and explainability, we need interdisciplinary researchers to work together to solve these problems. Thank you. Uh, Dong Xiao, you have some comments? Oh, uh, yes. Uh, I echo the um, first speaker, uh, first panelist uh, on the multi-disciplinary uh, collaborations. So I have the, the background from uh, both biology and, uh, and the computer science. So from that aspect, I can share what I saw, uh, you know, um, more, how the multi-disciplinary uh, uh, collaboration can, can be used, uh, can be leveraged to ensure the fairness in healthcare. So the first, I, I think the, the bias definition, right, in, in order to, to be ensure the fairness, so we need to first uh, uh, identify the, uh, uh, what are the bi potential bias, uh, either, you know, um, uh, knowing bias or unknowing bias. So what are uh, uh, protected attributes, right? So either uh, well-defined like uh, demographics or the latent bias, uh, latent, uh, you know, sensitive attributes or protected attributes. So I think this part of work uh, need to be uh, closely collaborated with the, the clinical researchers and the public health uh, experts. 
because they they are they are in the better position to define you know uh, what are uh, you know what are these uh, risk factor oh sorry what are these um, um, you know uh, sensitive attributes right so uh, once this is defined then uh, we all know the the bias uh, uh, actually uh, embedded in the data right so uh, coming originally from the data set so once we uh, define the bias then uh, the next step will be the the computer scientist and the statistician right to work on the data to uh based on the uh, well defined uh, uh, sensitive attributes uh then look at the data to see um how do we uh do the devising right so uh, so in this regard so there uh to me uh, <clears throat> there are three steps just like the, some of the speaker um, uh, has already presented uh, so uh, pre-processing and in-processing and the post-processing. So pre-processing -pre is a way to actually uh, debiasing, uh, to remove the bias from the training set, right? So uh, for example, um, uh, uh, given the defined attributes, sensitive attributes, right? So we can use the data augmentation, right? Like, uh, you know, Joy, uh, uh, Joy Wang, uh, uh, Dr. Wang already, uh, uh, be mentioned. We can do the data augmentation, uh, try to um, augment the data uh, to uh, to make the uh, uh, training cases in the minority group to be more equitable to with the majority group, right? So that's one example for the pre-processing, right? So uh, so that can be done uh, uh, by either computer scientist or statistician. Uh, of course, need to be uh, predefined by uh, the domain experts. So the second step, I mean, more likely for uh, you know uh, for machine learning researchers, right? So how to uh, develop the fairness aware uh, training algorithm, right? So uh, so that means uh, uh, with well defined sensitive attributes, right? How do we uh, develop the fairness fairness aware algorithm to uh, mitigate the bias? So for example, uh, you know we can um, actually. Um, Attack, for example, using adversarial attack, the attack the sensitive attributes, right, to compromise its, its ability uh, to uh, be predictive of the target, or we can uh, set the uh, another auxiliary task uh, for the model to predict the sensitive, sensitive targets, then uh, dis discourage of this task to being uh, achieved. So there's uh, some examples of. Uh, uh, what machine learning expert can be done in the training process to make make to uh, uh, to implement uh, fairness aware training. So uh, a third step will be a post post hoc, you know, post hoc uh, pro, uh, post processing or post hoc processing. Right in that case is, uh, you know, a user or any user or domain expert can interact with the trained model, right, to identify what are uh, you know uh, inference level. You know, a mitigation strategy can be used to uh, ensure the fairness. So, in, in summary, uh, I, I strongly advocate the collaboration between the, the domain experts and the computer scientists and statistician. So, the starting point will be a, a identification and the definition of the the sensitive sensitive attributes, then uh, followed by um, you know pre pre -proce uh, pre processing uh, in processing and the post-processing um, by uh, computer scientists and uh, statisticians. Thank you. OK, great comment. Uh, I see someone from the audience raised the hand. Uh, Sebo, do you want to uh, comment on something or ask a question? Uh, no, I think um, to give my honest opinion to Dr. Bo, she graciously asked, what do people in medical uh, field and in public health field think about you know, uh, the conversations we're having. So I'm a medical doctor and a professor of public health and medicine. Um, so uh, four years ago, if you had asked me the same question, Dr. Wa, I would have told you uh, everything that we're discussing today is flying above my head. I really don't get anything at all. Um, and But because of that, four years ago, I started an initiative with Georgetown called IT for Health and Education System Equity. I educated myself about artificial intelligence and machine learning and all. Why? Because we who are in medicine and public health, we don't sit at the same table with those who do the AI algorithms, who train the AIs. They are in separate universe, not world, universe than us, you know? And the second thing is the word artificial intelligence intimidates people 
in my field, global health and medicine and all why. It's called intelligence. I don't know if that was a marketing gimmick to call it intelligence or what. We feel like we're, we're working with someone super intelligent, you know, that, and if we even converse with that, we just are brainless, you know, how do we even talk to that? That's how um, people in my arena of public health and um, medicine feel. So there's a big gap, there's no bridge. There's no bridge between my field, which is health policy, global health systems and medicine, and then those who are working in the computer science, machine learning, AI. I have worked in this day in and day out for four years, and that's what I have come to realize. A bridge has to be built, you know? Like someone said earlier on, we in this side of the bridge, we don't need to know everything about AI, machine learning, the algorithms and all, no. I always tell my students, I really don't know how a microwave works, but I am very good at cooking using microwave. So it's the same thing. We don't need to know the in and out of things, but there are no bridge builders, Dr. Wong. There is no bridge builders. We need bridge builders from both sides of the arena who are willing to say, my field may be intimidating to people, medicine and public health and global health system. The same way most of the people that are in this room, your field is intimidating to people in my arena. So uh, some kind of bridge builders has to be built. And then the other is, um, um, a diverse group have to be brought in um, to address this bias and all really. the AI ethicists, the sociologists, the, those who are in law, the anthropologists, the computer science, the technology companies themselves, they need to be brought together in order we can bring out uh, something useful, not just for us, but for those who are training after us. So when you ask that personal question, I thought that maybe I'll give a personal answer to what you have asked. Thank you. Thank you. I really like your comment. You know, the bridge builder, you know, uh, people from a, a diverse disciplines to join together for their conversation. Uh, before the second question, I think uh, Hu Ling from the audience will make some comment. Yeah, hi, uh, I'm Hu Ling Wu, I'm a statistician, and also I'm a professor and chair at the Department of Biostatistics and Data Science at the uh, University of Texas Health Science Center at Houston. And uh, I have some comments or questions. And uh, when people talk about the bias, I know it's bias from data, bias from model or algorithm, or bias from uh, the result, whatever. My understanding is the bias, bias mostly coming from the data. The, the model part, or it doesn't matter if it's machine learning model or machine learning algorithm or even standard statistical model methods. We never develop those models, you know, methods in some bias. I, I thought that all the models, uh, algorithm are no bias, but this model can produce bias if the data are biased. So uh, is, is that right? You know, uh, so my understanding is only bias again from data. And uh, the last step is so-called reporting bias. When you get a result, you may, you may hide something, you don't report all the result fairly. So that's, you know, that's well known, you know, that, that's why many nature science papers are not reproducible, just because the reporting bias caused that. I, we know the reason, you know, we know that that's a statistical problem. You know. So it's, a, the, I mean, you know, like a couple of speakers also talk about that, you know, uh, anybody can explain with whether the model itself or algorithm is biased or how. I know the model can be used to uh, deal with the bias in the data, but you know, this model, model itself is not biased. Right? I think Leila has something to comment. Yeah, actually, I can elaborate on that a little bit. So, yeah, I, I totally agree that we have a lot of biases right now in data. And like, um, like if I introduce myself a little bit, I'm working on AI model fairness, specifically in medical imaging domain. And for example, we have shown that there is a huge unfairness in um, AI models developed for radiology application, we have, which we have been published in Nature Medicine, or we have shown that like AI models are able to, uh, for example, detect the race of the patient by just looking at their medical images. Uh, so, 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 uh, so this type of... Um, داشتم گفتم هممون از دم پیر شدیم اما آخرش نه آقا ما هیچ کدوم عاقل نشدیم مریان کود یو میوت یور سلف 
Oh, thank you. Yeah. So, uh, like always, I always get as someone who is working in this area, I always get this question, like where these biases are coming? Is it from data? Is it your model? Why you are saying AI models are, are unfair? Like these type of things. And um, to be honest, it's kind of sometimes hard to like differentiate model from um, like the model is the product and it's trained on the on what we have fit that. And as you mentioned, like if the data is biased, the model would be biased, like the outcome would be biased. Uh, but at the same time, I can say it's not like the data, it's the big source of biases, but it's not, it cannot be the only source of biases. Even the objective function that we are using for our AI model, that's, that could be interpreted as something within the model, but it can enforce some biases. For example, um, the, the very standard task that we are doing, we are uh, improving accuracy across all population in the data set. That's very a standard objective function that everybody used, like when we, we are training our AI model. But by doing that, we are enforcing some biases. Uh, so the model may perform better, like in some subgroups, not on the other groups. Like, so it's not, um, we shouldn't only think about the data side we should think of also like where the things that we can implement in our date in our algorithm or in our ai model to provide some more fairness so there are a lot of biases that we have in our data set maybe we cannot like internally like change all the data set we cannot provide accessibility for all patients uh like that's a huge infrastructure problem like but we can like do some uh, experiment, like trying to algorithmically solve this uh, type of uh, biases. So I would say like, it could be everywhere. <laughs> like I, it, it, data is a major source, but it's, it, it, it's not the only source kind of. Okay, thank you. Uh, it seems we have a long discussion for the first problem. So let's move on to the second one. Uh, how can current AI and machine learning technologies improve fairness in global health? Uh, who want to start with from our panelists? So how can we uh, improve the fairness in the global health by the uh, using current AI and machine learning technology? Uh, don't y'all please? Yeah, yeah, I, I just like to start a little bit this topic. Yeah, I, I think the the very important topic is the first to, to define the the task, right? I, I think the also uh, Rebecca also uh, mentioned in the email, right? So it really depends on what uh, systems, right? Uh, we are uh, working, we are trying to build, uh, to train, to make a prediction. So um, so it's very uh, uh, you know case specific. So for the for the uh, we also heard uh, many uh, excellent talks today, right? For example, we heard about uh, you know the fairness, uh, ensure the fairness in prediction modalities, right? Also in pre uh, in predicting the uh, post uh, natal uh, depression, you know those kind of different tasks. So for global health, is there's a, a additional layer of uh, complexity, right? There's a geographic uh, level of complexity. So uh, with that, uh, in addition to uh, well-defined tasks, we also need uh, geocoded data. So that's another um, kind of uh, requirement for, in terms of the training data. So I'll start uh, stop here. I mean, uh, other uh, panelists uh, free chime in. Anyone want to start? Uh, Rebecca, you want to follow up? Oh, please, Rebecca. So I don't know if this necessarily counts, but um, thinking about kind of current AI technologies, I think one aspect that's, I mean, kind of speaking from my own area is useful is that we're able to reach lots of different languages now than, than before. And so the ability to kind of communicate more broadly, um, it's not perfect. It, it, 
you know, um, certainly English support is much better than many other languages support, but nonetheless, there are some progress being made towards other languages. And as such, maybe it creates an opening for reaching a broader community beyond just um, kind of people in, in places that that have easy access to 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 medicine, perhaps it opens up the opportunity to reach out to to a broader area. Now, I understand just from discussing earlier that there are many um, obstacles, um, but I guess I'm kind of arguing on the something is better than nothing um, starting point, and then hoping to improve as time goes on. Thanks. Okay, uh, Leila, please. I can add a short comment that like AI helped us so far a lot to recognize these biases. Like when I was doing my literature review in 2019 for the first project that I was doing in fairness, like uh, there were not much papers or uh, on the fairness of AI models in healthcare domain. But now we are seeing a lot of uh, research going on in this area. So I think we should be thankful from AI for helping us to uh, find these biases, and it was very helpful. And now I think the next step, it will help us to remove these biases also in the future. Yes, so thank you. Uh, Fuli, do you want to add on about uh, the second question? Yes. Oh, oh, Crystal, yeah. Yes. Uh, just uh, quickly, but uh, suppose that the AI it's not biased, suppose, and global health, I'm, I'm pointing to a, a difficulty, in fact, more than a, a, a challenge, more than maybe improvement. But there is a problem in infrastructure, right? I mean, to, to there is no lack of talents in the global uh, south, let's say, of people who know AI and who know public health, who know who, who are doctors. And so human resources is important, but the, there is a lack of infrastructure to collect data digitally and to store it digitally. So, so, all, so also these uh, so big... Uh, big data really uh, analysis cannot be done with that big data really storage and currently it is still in the north i mean you have the facebook the microsoft the, App, the apple the, the google who who uh, who are uh, big players and this impacts maybe this will be covered later on but basically there is a problem in infrastructure not the human knowledge in, in the south but the infrastructure thank you uh, i think because AI is so powerful. And then we can ask the next question, what challenges exist in data gathering, sharing and policy to achieve fairness in health focused machine intelligence? You know, it is so powerful, but we still have many challenges. Uh, technically in the three area, data gathering, sharing and policy. Uh, Leila, please. Yeah, they are actually a lot of challenges exist right now in these areas. For example, in data collection, I can see like we have a lot of uh, shortcoming, like we don't have the good data that we want, especially when it comes to the fairness. Um, there are a lot of problems such as that they are sourcing policy. For example, we are not gathering race information of the patient. As a result, as a scientist, I cannot do fairness analysis to see if the models that we are developing, let's say in Canada, they are fair with respect to different races in the population or not. So these are um, like collecting the uh, demographic feature of the uh, patients is very important. Sometimes like governments uh, think that they are protecting the, the patient by doing so. Like they say, okay, let's don't put the race information and then we don't have any race uh, fairness problem. But the reality is that AI is more intelligent than what we are thinking. Like it can get the demographic feature from other features that is really hard for human to capture. And one of the example of that could be the race detection uh, uh, research that we had that was AI was able to de detect the patient race just by looking at their medical images. And I remember that all doctors in our team, they were shocked because it's not something that human can do. So um, when it comes to data collection, we really need uh, 
some rules, some policies to per, to help us to do uh, to collect the required data to be able to do the fairness and uh, uh, race detection. Uh, sorry, the, the fairness analysis. The other things that I can say is that uh, the data sharing we have a lot of um, shortcoming in that area as well. Like again, we are saying, oh, we want to protect patients, so let's don't share the data. So, and the, as a result, we cannot do enough study. Like I, as a scientist who is from university, I have tried a lot going, making connection with university, with hospitals, talking to doctors, asking them for sharing the data, building the trust. And most, several of time, like even in the last points, like they just vanish and they are not um like sharing the data though we are from universities like i mean when the patient sign an agreement saying that i'm i want my information be used for um, research he doesn't mean that a specific doctor in that specific hospital has to use that data for his research when i was working in hospital again like i came out of university i go to hospital doing the same research i see that even doctors neighbor doctors door to door same specialty same hospital they are not sharing their data easily to each other so there are a lot of problem in sharing data and i think we really need policy makers to do something in that area and all of them like they are hiding behind oh we want to protect patient but the data is de identified it's it's really hard to get the p and uh, the information of the patient and like we are all scientists we can sign all the agreements everything that you want to protect your patient even use the data in the hospital but i mean this is just mostly an an excuse not a real reason for not sharing the data the other things that I can say is that in addition to facilitating the sharing data sets within the hospitals or within one hospitals, I could say, even we need um, access to large public data set. One thing that I like a lot about, um, at least we have very good successful examples in US right now, for example, the MIMIC data set in uh, MIT, or there are some stand, uh, data set in Stanford University and several others that I may not be aware, aware of. So like NIH also gathered a lot of public data sets. And the good things is that like when they are working on providing large public data set available for scientists to be used all over the places in the world, Someone from Canada can do a study in, in, in US, someone from Europe can do a study on, on other region. And then like we have much better uh, way to kind of build the field, uh, solve the problems and provide, provide more fairness in the outcome. Okay, thank you. And don't show your comment. Oh, yes, yes. Uh, from technical perspective, uh, so there's always a challenge uh, for, you know, for uh, the trade-off between the uh, the privacy, security, and the performance, machine learning performance, right? So uh, from technical perspective, I just want to, want to add that there, um, there are new uh, development, maybe not so new development to ensure the privacy aware or security aware uh, training, a uh, machine learning model training. Uh, yeah, one of the more, uh, I think, active research area is the federative learning, right? So that, you know, the data stay uh, where they are. And, uh, you know, uh, so the collaboration is done uh, from multiple sites. Uh, so what, what was shared uh, are model parameters, uh, not the actual data per se. So the data st still stays uh, where they are. Uh, but the, but the model parameter model being trained on each site and uh, model parameters are shared, you know, um, you know, through multiple iterations and, uh, you know, um, collab is also collaboratively training, uh, so, sometimes we call. So that's one uh, technical solution. Another technical solution actually was mentioned uh, in today today's presentation. Uh, I think Dr. Wang from Purdue and uh, she mentioned uh, to ensure the the fairness without uh, demographics variables, right? So using the label smoothing approach. So that's another, uh, I mean, possible direction of, uh, you know, uh, pri privacy aware or security aware machine learning. So that's a talk about the data sharing. For data collection, um, it's always uh, challenging because uh, we need an automated agent, right? To interact with patients. 
And uh, you know, it's more like a, we, we need to provide a, a interface. Um, so uh, on this aspect, I think the most recent uh, generative AI chatbot uh, can be a promising direction. Uh, although you know, right now the uh, it's a lot of risk associated with that. Um, you know, uh, safety risk and ethics risk. But in the long run, uh, I think uh, using, uh, you know, large language model uh, based chatbot is a promising way to uh, to scale up the, the collection of the, uh, the, 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 the health data. So that, that's the two uh, aspects regarding the data collection and the data sharing um, from technical perspective. Thank you for your input and crystal yes, uh, given the time i will i will mention policy uh, and focus on it here i think that uh, personally that uh, uh, there should be something similar to so policy makers should play a role and an active role i mean there is we cannot just release an ai system in the health sector without really uh, that ai system being vetted and there should be something similar to FDA and maybe FDA, I'm not sure, but uh, to, uh, uh, to give a stamp, I mean, official stamp that this AI system has been vetted for fairness and it is not biased and so on and so forth. So I think this is uh, still um, missing and this should be not really left to big tech companies to uh, uh, release software and that can software be biased as has been mentioned in the presentations it can really do harm, not really only good, I mean, it can do harm. Yes, totally agree. And then we can move on to the uh, uh, next question. How can AI integration in global health systems promote equity and social justice? Any comments from our panel? Equity, social justice, or the buzzword. So I think the way that we want to do is that like, like the ultimate goal of everyone is right now to get to the point that provide fair AI model by using, by, the, by getting access to kind of developing maybe more fair data sets. Like AI help us to, again, I, I mentioned that, but AI help us to find lack of fairness so lack of fairness could be anywhere like in data in models in the algorithms that we build in the objective function that we are defining in the way that we are interpreting our results it could be all over the pipeline and again ai can help us to find those um, points and trying to remove those um, uh, problems as a result like if we try to work hard in this AI model and try to make them fair, it provide more uh, fair world and provide more social, uh, more justice uh, for people in access to care. Any other comments from our panel? Oh, yeah, I just, oh, sorry. Sorry. Um, so I guess one question I have is somewhat related also to what Christo was talking about earlier too. I think something that also relates to the previous question, um, in a way it's not just that we need to go out and, and collect more uh, representative data, but that we also need to convince the population uh, themselves that that the system is trustworthy enough for them to give this information, right? Because a lot, I know that a lot of people are distrustful of, of systems that ask them for all of these private information. And so in order to get to a point where we can promote equity and social justice, I think for one thing, we need to assure um, the, 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 the population um, in this particular case, um, the more kind of historically um, mistreated in a way, uh, population, right? So, so there were examples in the past of, of, of their data being misused or, or exploited in different ways. And I think that has to be addressed in some way, um, either through policy or through um, 
um, kind of more transparency um, so that um, you get more buy-in from the, 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 the people we're trying to reach. And that would make the overall process, I think, a little bit more equitable. Thanks. Don't show your comment. Yeah, uh, yeah, sure. So uh, assuming uh, still uh, when you talk about the global health system, right, it still is, is uh, task by task. It, it, so assuming the task is well defined and also the protected attributes uh, or sen sensitive attributes are also well defined, I think the AI integration can speed up the, you know, or can, can enable the automated uh, detection of a bias and uh, basically flag, flag the bias for human expert, for the end user domain experts. Uh, uh, for, for their attention to, uh, to mitigate it. So, yeah, that's it. Bristol, please. Yes, uh, so, but I think that at the, I mean, continuing just uh, the idea that uh, at the at the end, that is a human. I mean, the humans need to define for the AI how to detect and what is a bias to define it exactly so that the AI can do it then automatically maybe. I have, I have since we're talking global health and so there is a concern that I mean most of the technology is in the north I mean, and, 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 and going in the direction also of, of people being wary of things that have happened in the past and then how can we use this new technology in what context I think people in the South need to be, I mean, are, are wary, I mean, because uh, uh, the uh, colonizing powers, I mean, have used before technology, it was uh, in different kind of technologies, also to basically exploit the South. So AI is a new technology, and it's very powerful and could be also used in this sense. So I think that is a, a, a real uh, uh, risk here and, uh, and people in the global health and in the global south need to be know to know also uh, and to uh, to to think about this issue and to uh, uh, also in collaboration with with uh, researchers in the north also probably but uh, they have to think about uh, the risks of AI being used by uh, powerful uh, people who have the money and people who have uh, the power to to use it while it is underused and probably there is no infrastructure as i as i said uh, lacking infrastructure in the south so the the question of north south even the digital divide can be reinforced by ai so here there is a, a risk that has to be thought of and, and analyzed in the process um and there are other issues but that's that's it for for this point so since we uh, only have four more minutes, so I uh, brought my last question. How do AI cultures and worldviews interact? Uh, we need to build our trust you know, in the AI or even you know, people uh, in science in general, but how do AI cultures and worldviews interact with each other? Um, I can start. I mean, this, um, yeah, I mean, the question of North, North South is 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 one question about really world views or cultures, right? I mean, which cultures are represented in AI? Basically, currently AI is a product of the North, and so the cultures of the North are more represented. Even in the same society, we can see that uh, uh, there is a, a, a digital divide, or or the algorithms can be biased uh, uh, against certain populations and uh, not others. Um, so the impact. Uh, yeah, that there was a call a few days ago I mean, by researchers uh, asking for a, uh, to think about, uh, uh, in fact, it was a moratorium, I mean, to, to stop chat GPT or development in the sense for six months to think about the impact of AI. And I think that's, that's, uh, that's important. Important to usually we, I mean, I'm an engineer, right, in background. So we do things because we can do them. And it's good that we have such forums like this one today to think about, okay, should we do that? I mean, what can we do and what in what context should we do things? So suppose, it, it, how, how can cultures and worldviews interact with AI? I mean, why should we use AI? That's a question that we never ask, but probably because we think that is positive. Let's say it, it improves efficiencies in hospitals. And why should it improve efficiencies in hospitals? Is it so? So the question why is not really simple to answer it it is answer 
based on our worldview. So I answer it in based on my worldview and others probably will have same worldview and others will have different worldviews. So maybe to get efficiencies, what should we do with the efficiencies? Is it to, to make profit or is it to serve more people in an equitable way? So these kind of questions about how do we want to use AI is not to be left to researchers alone, not to be left to technical people alone, not to be left to technology companies alone. It should be also the, the questions to be answered by citizens. And I think that we don't, we, ha we have no mean currently to, to have a really, to consult with citizens on how do we want to use AI uh, uh, for health. Great comment. Uh, any other ideas from our panel? Maybe I'll just very quickly mention, um, I see that in chat, there has been a comment that says uh, specifically that um, the violation of trust was not just historical or in the past and they're very present and ongoing. And that's certainly true. And I think part of this um, question about how to, um, how does, how do AI and culture and worldviews interact is kind of in this, this space of trying to resolve these problems in some way. Um, so it is commented that overlooking the current ways that technology is weaponized against disenfranchised group is part of the reasons folks may not trust technologies like AI. And I take that point um, very much. Um, but then there's kind of this vicious cycle that I'm observing that because there's lack of trust, then there's lack of data, and then that leads to even more disenfranchisement that leads to even more distrust. And so we need some way to bridge that. And earlier in the, in the session, we talked about bridging between the AI researchers and the public policy researchers to have kind of a greater understanding. I think there's also a strong need for just general uh, bridge to be built between the people who are building the technology and the people whose lives are actually being affected by the technology. Thanks. Thank you so much. So to keep off the track of our time, uh, we finished the first panel and uh, I really appreciate the four great panelists and hopefully, you know, we'll see you in person sometime in the future. So I will give the floor to Jude for the second panel. Thank you. Thank you. Nice to meet you all. Nice to meet you. Thank, Thank you, you for the opportunity. Thank you so much, Wendy, and thanks for the brilliant panel session. And we want to thank our panelists for accepting to come and share the knowledge with us. Uh, it was very enriching. Um, I listened to it and I took down notes. I think all my pages are all filled. So we will be moving on to our second panel session. And we'll, moving from here, we'll be looking at culture, politics, ethics, and efficacy of AI for global health. And joining us today in order of, uh, in alphabetical order of last name, we will be joined by Dr. Professor Ramnek Oluwalia, who is the Chief Executive Officer of Higher Health, the organization that looks into the health, wellness, and development needs of all public universities, technology colleges, vocational colleges, community colleges, private higher education institutions, work and skilled across all boards in South Africa. He is part of the national task teams on COVID mental health, HIV, TB, GBV, disability, drugs, addiction, and uh, national health insurance. Professor Aluwalia, with his team, has developed the South African biggest digital COVID screening system called HealthCheck. Please let's put our hand together and welcome our first panelists on board. Um, next, joining us is, in order again, in order of alphabetical order, is Barista Ofodu, who is joining us from York University. Barista Ofodu uh, has experience, is an experienced lawyer with expertise in human rights, tech, and artificial intelligence, and has demonstrated history of working across various national, regional, and international institutions. Please let's welcome Barista Ofodu on stage. Next, we have Dr. Egan, who is joining us from the famous Allen Turing Institute. I must say strongly and stress on this that Dr. Egan is the founding director of the Data for Policy Conference, as well as the 
editor in chief of the data and policy journal. If you never know, please look, this is the top journal, I think the only journal on data and policy. Uh, she has two roles at the uh, Turing as open infrastructure strategy lead and AI for science and government team lead for tools, practices, and systems. Please let's welcome Dr. Egan on stage. Next, we have Dr. Miyongo, who is joining us from the African Population and Health Research Center that's based in Kenya. Her research interest lies in finding solutions that impact real public health problems related to the health disparities, distribution of disease, and outcome, particularly in women's well being, using hierarchical and dependent data models, clustering, time to event models, and casual inference in the viral epidemiology of HIV, COVID-19 association with social comorbidities like mental health and gender-based violence. Let's welcome uh, Dr. Miyongo on stage. Um, the rule for this will be, uh, if you have any question, our panelists will go through the set of questions that we have discussing. And then at the end, we'll call on the public to ask any question regarding the topic addressed by panelists to the panelists. So I will ask the same question across the board. And each time I ask a question to a panelist, if another panelist have actually echo the viewpoint that the panelists have, please, you can just ask to move on so that we move on to the next panelist and then we we'll go through that. Um, the first question that we have here is, with respect to politics, values, ethics, and social realities, what are the lessons of COVID-19 pandemic for AI in global health? So I will first of all start with uh, Professor Ramnik. Um, well, thank you, thank you, everyone, and thank you, Jude, and, and it's an absolute honor. Um, um, I'm I'm traveling and I'm in India, so it's quite late in the night here. Uh, uh, Jude, um, I think the question is very relevant. Um, uh, one of the example of why I'm here in this meeting with you and as a panelist is purely because you have to marry politics with uh, with now artificial artificial intelligence and data in the future if you want to collect data from communities. And I think COVID-19 was a perfect example where the world had to unite together. Um, <clears throat> one of the examples uh, from my own, um, uh, from our own work in South Africa has been um, when the COVID-19 hit South Africa and, the ins and the, the, everything was in a complete lockdown. Um, if we wanted to get to the public, to, to the communities, uh, we, needed, uh, we needed policy buy-in. And for that, we need politics and we need government in reality, which means uh, it's, it, it's critical now. COVID-19 was a perfect example where, where it, was, it was for the scientists now to go and explain to the political world and to the governments all around to believe in developing policies that will help us collect more community data so that we can spread the outbreak or we can prevent the spread of the outbreak. Uh, health check, as you rightfully said when you, were in, when you were mentioning about our work, was a good example. It was an AI tool that was built in South Africa, predominantly to give green passports for young students entering into schools, into universities, into colleges, because we could not have the liberty of, of uh, totally going online. Uh, South Africa is a third world country. We do not have the devices and, the, and if we have to save an academic year, we had to open our institutions of higher learning irrespective of the, the, the huge waves of COVID around us. And one was to screen people before they enter into institutions. So you can't screen them on, by having long queues outside for people to enter the institutions. The best way was to use artificial intelligence. But this idea, which was brought to develop green passports, link it to a national system of tracking and tracing, could only be done if policy could be created in a very quick space. If COVID-19 policy warrants uh, as, as public to use this tool in order for us to be able to track and trace infections, control outbreaks, and do quick intervention in the community. So I think ethically, um, as well as um, political buy-in, these are two difficult subjects, what one has to marry, 
if we want to win uh, community data. And in, to be very honest, uh, I think the, the world where we are heading towards, by the time we collect data in the hospitals, it's a bit too late. The time if we want to prevent an infection, we want to prevent a, a pandemic, we want to prevent outbreaks, the only way is to get early signs and that can only happen if we have community data. Community data is very difficult to collect, but it's only possible if we have political buy-in, policy interventions, and we can, as, as uh, scientists, be able to show the evidence-based um, work of artificial intelligence. So it's a difficult uh, area, it takes a lot of time, but when done, can, can build a number of systems for us to, to deal with pandemics. Uh, I'll stop here, Jude, and let others speak about it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Ramnik. Uh, by political buy-in and locally relevant data. And in order to get that locally relevant data, you do need political buy-in. Thank you so much. I'll move to Professor Opadu to, to answer the question. And I will want to repeat the question again. With respect to politics, values, ethics, and social realities, what are the lessons of the COVID-19 pandemic for AI in global health? Uh, thank you very much, Professor Jude. Um, really happy to connect. Um, also, out of jurisdiction, I'm in Kenya at the moment, so it's almost uh, midnight here. But I'm really happy to, um, you know, to speak about this very important topic. Um, I think Prof has already made the most that critical point about political buying. But I would like to add to, you know, to sort of emphasize the fact that when we talk about um, fairness when it comes to machine learning or AI for health um, generally, it's very deeply political for four reasons. Number one is from our lessons from COVID, we've understood that access is a very big problem. Just like South Africa, um, most of the sub-Saharan countries um, have an access problem when it comes to um, infrastructure. Um, also when it comes to, you know, access to AI powered healthcare. So um, the significant benefits in terms of improving diagnosis, personalized treatment, um, or the better outcomes that we've seen that the use of AI can do for COVID and other um, public health emergencies, access is definitely a political issue because access to healthcare is often tied to, um, to economic status, often tied to, you know, the fact that certain people have limited access to social um, inequalities. The second is when we talk about um, the implications, the political implications for global health, um, AI seems to be very heavy on like the privacy concerns, which you all know about. And it's also a political issue because governments get to navigate um, the political area around data privacy to ensure um, how can these AI systems be used responsibly and ethically? What standards are meant to be cotoed to? Is it constitutional? Is it uh, theoretical? Like, it's, the privacy concerns are deeply political, but two other reasons are also quite important to restate. One would be the issue around public trust, right, which has been spoken extensively about in the previous panel. Um, but the other part would be about global cooperation. What we've learned from COVID is um, a COVID-19 pandemic in Guateng province or in Cape Town, South Africa, means the same for Abuja, Nigeria, means the same for Toronto, Canada, means the same for Beijing, China. So COVID here automatically means COVID there because we're dealing with a public health um, um, crisis. So we need to ensure that uh, the global cooperation from a political standpoint um, is there to help transform global health outcomes. So if we can think about global cooperation and coordination, we must think about the need for governments to be able to work together, to share data, to develop common standards for AI in healthcare and ensure the benefits of the technology are shared equitably across different regions and different people across the world. Thank you so much, Bas Ofodu. Global cooperation and coordination, very, very, very important. So I, I will move to Dr. Egan to articulate again. I'm, I will read the question with respect to politics, values, ethics, and social realities. What are the lessons of the COVID 19 pandemic for AI in global health? Thank you, Jude. Uh, very pleased to be here. Um, thanks for the invitation. Um, so to me, the I, I want to start with the very positive, actually. The AI during COVID-19 has shown us that there's huge potential, for example, to find solutions quickly. Uh, we had AI uh, basically helping accelerate the pace, the speed of uh, vaccines, 
being developed in the end, and that was that was a huge thing apparently. Um, other things, uh, I cannot say that it was so much AI, but generally technology use, so like the tracing, tracking applications, uh, early warning prevention, diagnosis, early diagnosis um, approaches, they were all uh, sort of heavily talked around the digital infrastructure and, and, uh, and the applications, mobile applications and, and, and such. It wasn't AI, but there are still learnings, learnings to to uh, learnings from this process for AI uh, in, in the end. Because if we are ever going to use AI in these sort of processes, then we are really looking onto onto the same problems. Like uh, earlier, Jake was uh, mentioning, the privacy issues are going to be the same uh, for prevention. If it is a misdiagnosis or a miswarning, then then you have that problems and AI is very likely to, to, to get into these sort of behaviors in the future. Um, also on the negative side, uh, we had a lot of disinformation throughout the COVID, uh, especially in the early uh, stages when people were so panicked. And uh, that sort of this, um, this, um, this information online did cause panic in, in places. And again, I mean, with, um, with AI, we could expect to see um, uh, I mean, if, if not done properly, if not controlled properly, uh, tamed properly, then we, we, we could easily say, see that AI is playing really nasty impact in that in those sort of situations, uh, if you're not careful. And the bias issues obviously has been the topic of this uh, this workshop. Um, what we have seen again in in during pandemic, um, yes, the access issue. If if the infrastructure is not uh, uh, sufficient for certain groups, then they they were very clearly discriminated or not accounted for. Uh, but it was also uh, the literacy uh, the literacy problem that we have seen. Uh, I'm I'm in London. I'm based in London, and we did see uh, some cases where communities who don't sufficiently speak English weren't basically understanding the uh, warnings and the and, and the uh, advice, and and therefore the uh, fatalities were, were were a lot higher in comparison to rest of the uh, population here in London, even in a developed if you if you if you say that it, it's a developed economy. Um, so I, I could think of these these sort of issues, but I think it all uh, the, the most important of all uh, probably the best, the most important lesson is is what Jake was saying earlier. It's the cross um, cross border collaboration issue. Um, well, the pandemic is is not. I mean, it's not an issue where you, where, which you can deal within national boundaries or any specific jurisdiction. It has to be global. You cannot uh, you cannot keep it in in one place, and and, you, and solutions also have to be basically uh, is is essentially trans translatable, translational to other geographies, other locations. And unless you get this international coordination and collaboration in the right way. Um, well, you can you cannot do anything about it, and for AI, um, it can be really generalized for all sorts of all sorts of things. AI is again very data dependent, very um, uh, well high tech dependent, computing infrastructure dependent, uh, and and it impacts everyone uh, essentially, increasingly everyone. Um, and and this this is an area that we that we have to absolutely get this international collaboration and coordination right. So um, I'll, I'll leave it there for now. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tafegan. So we heard of the, the earlier diagnosis, digital infrastructure, this and misinformation, the panic that led place in multiple places, and emphasis on cross border collaboration. What is happening next door will come knocking. And no matter what, those are the politics and lessons that we have learned from COVID-19 to take over. I will move to um, Dr. Miyongo, who, uh, and again, I will ask the same question. With respect to the politics, values, ethics, and social realities, what are the lessons of the COVID-19 pandemic for AI in global health? You are muted. Can you unmute yourself, Dr. Miyango? Can you unmute yourself? Yeah, thanks, George, and, and thanks to the panelists. So on top of 
what my fellow panelists have just mentioned. I'm based here in Nairobi and have been working a lot with the, within our AI for COVID project. And within that project, we've experienced um, lots of learnings based on the work we do in the sub-Saharan Africa. But I, I want to point out two less, a few key lessons for us. And one of the major limitations we found is that within the, not just for COVID, but especially because we were working with COVID, we, we, we found that there was a lot of underrepresentation of marginalized communities within the data that we collected that was present in the public domain or even with private or public uh, providers. So one of the things that we, we set out to do is to explore how, what was missing in fact from what was available. So there, there were lots of things to do with the, the lack of, uh, built by the lack of trust the, the lack of representation of those marginalized communities. So if we if one collected data from the hospital, then anyone who couldn't afford to go to the hospital was missing. So if, if they went to social media, then it represented young people. So there were lots of things we, we had to deal with in order to, to bring in the representation, but there was also the lack of mutual representation of communities and that also escalated the, the, the issues around misinformation because of this lack of trust. And when policymakers were, were deliberating on efforts to contain the pandemic, most of the, the decisions were, were sort of based on the, on the power, high powered, um, uh, provisions from either hospitals or other providers who were high, had high influence within that space. So other uh, other representations, the lack of um, public health data or data from communities, and and having a lot of representation from clinical uh, hospitals or health facilities also brought in a lot of. Um, uh, uh, issues around who, what impact this had in terms of the overall response and, and the fact that often the interpretation of the results of the findings are based on the policymakers' interests or, or they, they say, because there's the lack of uh, shared understanding of what the problems are given that the marginalized communities are left out. The, the, there was a lot of work to do with trying to bring the different stakeholders on board and trying to bring all those communities to speak to each other, to come to some mutual understanding of the problem and also address the issues, the solutions around. The other thing was the, the, the complete, and this was mentioned by somebody previously, the, the lack of trust in the use of AI. So once the, 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 the other, the, the stakeholders don't understand, they still think AI is like a black box, it's a time bomb. So if, if they don't understand it, if we don't decipher the information that we hope to, to use to convince them or to disseminate or to communicate even to citizens, then it's still, there's still a lot of lack of trust and issues around privacy and confidentiality when they release data to the public domain. Thank you. Thank you very much. I, I like the fact that the, the message here is emphasized on locally relevant data and buy-in. Um, so throughout this panel, we've heard of the first question, we've heard of um, global cooperation and coordination, local government buy-in to ensure that local, locally relevant data is put to use. Like that. We'll move to the next question. And in the next question, the next question will be, how can local governments and private ventures work together to ensure broader access of important data and responsible AI solutions to help shape policy and promote more efficient and equitable programming. Again, I will start with Professor Ramnik and I'll put the question on the chat. 
No, thank you, Jude. Uh, I think uh, we, what we call it is a public-private partnership. Uh, I think COVID was a great example. Um, I, I must mention that artificial intelligence, we always knew, will be the solution towards getting community data or multiple data sets and analyzing. It's going to be impossible if we're dealing with pandemics as big as COVID-19 was. And I think every nation of ours are dealing with some of the other challenges, whether they're social or they're pandemics or, or viral or health. Um, and, and for that, you need to analyze multiple community data. And that can be solved through proper ethical use of artificial intelligence. Uh, and, and for that reason, if we are looking at community and we're looking at population-based data, then the, then the solution is a very big uh, a combination of both pol political buy-in as well as private sector buy-in. Another example of COVID-19 was now we developed the system called Health Check. Now we knew people have a phone, but we do not know whether they have a smartphone, which means you have to make uh, accessible uh, data, receiving data from people and giving them opportunities to the public by providing different platforms like a USSD, like a WhatsApp, like web forms, which means what you need is private sector, uh, private sector service providers, tele telecommunication service providers. You need, um, in South Africa, we needed Vodacom, MTNs, quite big giants here, or Vodafone as we know in the world. And what they did was they started helping by coming on the party when you're looking at population-based based uh, and you know it's a win-win uh, every whenever we're talking about a public private partnership it has to be a win-win between both public and the private sector so you need to give private sector the incentive of what they're going to achieve while while they make it accessible for population to be able to do this without having to spend um, costing or money which they have to do on daily basis or they have to do at times when they when you're looking at a mass population. So I think AI will need a public-private partnership. Now, even to develop artificial intelligence, these algorithms, when you're looking at community data or population-centric data, and specifically, I'm not only talking about population-centric, we're talking about a patient-centric itself. If you're talking to, to treat a patient, you need a multiple data sets through the history, through, through algorithms from all sorts of the person to make accurate diagnosis, to help the patient. And that can only be done if private sector buys into artificial intelligence or hospital groups buy into, private doctors buy into, so the data can be fed for the patient's development. So right from a patient development to community data, everything will need a public-private partnership, whether it's a cell phone provider, whether it's a private hospital, whether it's private doctors. So I think artificial intelligence a combination of both public policies and private sector is the only way if I can find out to move forward. Thanks, Jude. Thank you so much. Political buy-in and private sector buy-in. So I will move to Professor Ofodu to equally address the same question. And again, I read, how can local government and private ventures work together to ensure broader access of important data and responsible mm -hmm. AI solutions to help shape policy and promote more efficient and equitable programming? Thanks, Professor Jude, and thanks for gifting me the title of professor. <laughs> I'm not there yet. <laughs> um, but yes, to to add to what Professor Ramnik has said, um, with PPP, definitely, I would talk from a legal perspective, as a lawyer who works in the field of AI, PPPs are very important, especially in the ways that local government and private ventures can have their public-private partnership agreement in a way that shows responsible AI use and in the way that these um, agreements can actually address specific pressing policy challenges in healthcare for that is particular to the local government or the area. Um, I also like what Prof said about, you know, the incentives for a lot of African communities, like what is the benefit? You're talking about how, I think what is exciting for AI developers and like the global healthcare professionals is not might not be exciting for the local communities um, where these local government leaders want to show and tell like, hey, this is what the AI will do for you in a way that is positive. The other two things I would say is, again, from a legal perspective, which is very important, is data sharing agreements. I think 
local governments and private ventures can enter into um, data sharing agreements that will allow for the responsible and ethical sharing of data, right? So the data is available. Maybe we're not mining in, in enough local data. Maybe we're not deploying the use of enough local data, but also the modalities for how this data is being used or collected needs to be enforced in an agreement in such a way that um, you know, the researchers, the policymakers have access to these data, even other stakeholders can use this data sharing agreement as a platform to sort of develop the data culture, you know, for that use. The only other thing I would add would be um, open source software. Again, I say this from a legal perspective, there are like so many open source software agreements when it comes to um, private ventures who want to work with local or regional government. Um, they can develop this open source open source software agreement whereby local governments can develop responsible AI solutions or allow for that to happen, you know, within their spaces. Definitely, we all know the, you know, the value for this in ways that it can help ensure that the benefits of AI are accessible to all, but more importantly, accessible to the point whereby it can actually trickle down to the individual communities. The last thing I would say is, you know, when it comes to engaging with local governments, you need to ensure that government officials are gatekeepers and they want to see something that tallies with their, you know, their political mandate or something that reflects the intention of the current government that they serve. So it's important to, to see how that can tie down. So, you know, when we talk about these ventures who want to work in AI and work with government, there needs to be a meeting point. Is it related to the SDG goals that the state is definitely um, like um, accustomed to? Are there existing local structures um, that these these that you can tie into, right? Basically, what I'm saying is there needs to be an assessment of strategic priorities, assessments of strengths and weaknesses. And we can say this over and over again for the African continent, um, hardware access is still a major challenge, right? We can talk about the use of AI, but if it's not complemented by, you know, a adequate hardware provision, um, you know, we'll still be facing a lot of challenges. So yes, Prof. I said PPPs, uh, talk about the incentives, but yes, data sharing agreements are important. Collaborative research projects, very important. Local governments and private ventures can collaborate on research projects. Open source software, very important. And of course, um, we can't undermine the need to think with, what is beneficial to the local community? What would the gatekeepers work with or run with that would help advance the goals on their behalf and our goals as practitioners as well? Thank you. Thank you very much. You all heard it. Data sharing agreements, open source software, encourage assessment of strategic priorities, collaborative research projects. I'll move to Dr. Egan to address the same question. And again, how can local government and private ventures work together to ensure broader access of important data and responsible AI solutions to help shape policy and promote more efficient and equitable programming. Thanks. Um, it's actually difficult to speak after the previous two speakers because they really lifted everything almost. Um, I can also reinforce the incentive uh, point uh, first, basically, but maybe it's slightly from a different perspective. Um, I, I, I would be suspicious, really, if we are going to ever uh, achieve a good um, public-private um, collaboration uh, unless we, uh, we, we address the issue of, yes, incentives in the end. It's the, well, profit, uh, private ventures are profit-oriented. They want to uh, maximize their returns in the end and uh, any uh, any uh, anything um, any advantage they, they, they will want to use it for uh, to maximize them to maximize their profits in the first place if, even if it is in a sort of a very catastrophic situation like the covid-19 you cannot they cannot rely on their goodwill in the in the first place uh, as as a first thing uh, there, that when it comes to local governments, uh, there are other sorts of uh, incentive issues. Again, there are lots of political uh, pressure. Well, generally, government institutions are not really that much uh, uh, understanding the AI or those sort of technologies. Well, they don't. They usually lack the capacity uh, to to uh, understand or to process the whole uh, knowledge. Uh, and, and they usually have resource constraints, essentially, in, in this space. And trying to align these two, two very different uh, 
sets of incentives and very different sets of ways of doing business, doing work is essentially a challenge for us to overcome. But I agree, this is absolutely necessary, essential if you want to move forward. Um, the solution is potentially uh, going to be, it's, it's not just data um, framework, but I was more thinking like generally uh, also uh, thinking about trustworthy uh, data sharing and collaboration infrastructure as a whole. Data is part of this, but also maybe the technology infrastructure to process that data, maybe whether it is, I don't know, like federated ways of processing things or uh, distributed decentral, de decentralized uh, ownership control, IP uh, or profit uh, share models, etc. So these are the, the things that we need to get right to to really ensure that everybody gets what they want, but they, at the same time, the overall product works for the common good, essentially for the public interest in the end. And I again agree that it's the open science, open open uh, data co-creation, research co-creation culture that that uh, that that is going to take us forward. We need to invest on that, um, uh, and 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 that has to be again the private sector needs to uh, have incentives. We need to have those economic models uh, where these sort of things, the open source making their so code open or making their open data data open will will make sense uh, for them as well. Um, yes, it's really a reinforcement of the previous points, uh, but maybe there's no harm in repeating them. Thanks. Thank you very much. Um, so incentives, which is very important, data sharing and technological infrastructures to be created, open data and research co-creation. Thank you so much. I'll move to Dr. Miyongo to address the same question and I'll repeat the question. How can local government and private ventures work together to ensure broader access of important data and responsible AI solutions to help shape policy and promote more efficient and equitable programming? Yeah, thanks, Jude. I, I think, yeah, I, I just have maybe one or two points to add on to what they said, or, or maybe just reinforce those two points. So one of the, the issues here is this private, um, public-private partnership is, is something that we are always looking towards uh, doing most of the time, but it's not very clear how this uh, evolves, especially in different contexts. So the issue here is that that kind of partnership um, would benefit from the, the, the public and private developing, uh, documenting best practices of bringing different stakeholders on board, especially to, 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 to improve the, the injustices or the ethical and social consequences that we experience as we implement the AI. So the, the fact that most of the privates come in with the, sort of a lot of influence and power. They, there's that uh, inequity in power because they, they, they then have a lot of money to, to bring on board. And that, that already determines what you can do or how much you can do in the context of working with communities or the public or even within local government. So that's still a big issue. And, and I think the imbalance in power creates this, uh, this sort of lack of shared interest in, in what the, 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 a, the goal of that partnership should be. So one of the, the other things that I think the, the public-private partnership, especially given that we with COVID, there was a large scale of data coming from different sources and many governments could not host that kind of data. So there is the lack of infrastructure, technological infrastructure, and this is where the public-private partnerships would help. So most of the time you have to look for where you host the data, even with the most governments would have to look for where to host the data, the, the scale of data. So if we are talking about increasing this to population health or community health data and including that, then 
we need to, to support the infrastructure. And, and that's something, if it's, it's not supported, then yeah. So this partnership could provide that kind of support. And also there's a lot of, um, much as they, there's a lot of skills built within the continent in terms of um, the capacity to, to use or to, to implement the, the data or the AI within the context. There's a lot of um, capacity building that goes into the practicality of making these things functional, the, the systems functional, because we already have fragmented data systems and they don't speak to each other. So there's a lot of work that needs to be done there. Thank you. Thank you very much. Support infrastructure, imbalance in power, and public-private sector partnership. Uh, I will now open to the public uh, before I go back to the remaining questions to see if anybody from the public have a question to ask our great panelists that have been so great this evening. Please put up your hand, and then I will give you the mic to ask your question. Okay, while we wait for questions in the public, I'll move to the next question and I will start in the reverse order while waiting for questions in the public. Please do put your hand if you have a question at this point or type it on the chat. I'll move to the next question and I will start with Dr. Miyongo, uh, if that's okay. Um, and the next question that I wanna ask is, do data and AI solutions really improve decision-making for public health policymakers? I will start in the reverse order from uh, Dr. Miyongo. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, George. I, I, I really think data and AI solutions really improve, improve decision making, given that we, we saw a, a lot of data coming in, big data, and the scale of data could, it, it would benefit from the AI tools and solutions that were in place, even though there were limitations in how we could use this. So, First of all, in bringing diverse data sources together, integrating diverse data sources, then better developing or improving uh, evidence models for specific disease decision making. So the, the policies around that were greatly improved by the fact that, yeah, we could not reach communities when COVID struck but we had to depend on the systems that we had in place. And most of that was to do with um, the, the, the AI tools in place, even though they, they, they were limited in our context, especially the, given the, the fact that we, we worked in, we, we wanted to, to have that representation from communities that were missing, from voices that were not heard during the pandemic. So, and, and in order to do that, I think what needs to happen is the need for better coordination of different stakeholders on board. We saw that they, they, there was need for not just the, the policy and public health experts, but there were the anthropologists, economists, uh, technology experts, they, what you call the, the private sector, civil society in terms of advocacy, and in terms of, um, of getting to communities, so they, they, there was the community networks that are seen through community health workers or volunteers. So there was, uh, those things can happen or can be better done or in, implemented to see the, the, the impact that that could have on improving policy decision making in, in this space. And, and we need accountability for those research results that we get and decision-making. We need to co create conditions that favor, that favor a positive impact on the gendered, uh, for example, the gendered in inequities that we saw. The, 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 the pandemic itself was very gendered. So we, we saw different impacts on men and women and girls. So, more women were exposed at the same time, more men died from COVID, maybe because of different things that we could, ex we could have explored better. So some of those things need to happen if we create positive conditions to, for us to see the impact. And then the thing with the AI, a, a lot, we, we, I still think 
there's a lot of monetization around AI. So that creates those um, inequities in healthcare. So as, as long as it's monetized, highly monetized, then it, the inequities are amplified or reinforced in different ways. But yeah, uh, as it, the saying goes, the AI tools by themselves are not solutions. So we need to work in that space with all the other stakeholders and the communities within those countries. Thank you. Thank you so much. Need for coordination, breaking silos, accountability, and creating conditions for uh, that favor positive impact. I'll move with Dr. Ingen to address the same question. Thanks. Okay, thanks, Jude. Um, so, the, the question is a yes no question. Do the data and AI solutions really improve? The answer for me is yes, really. There's a lot of potential for uh, AI to help uh, policy decision making in any sector. And uh, that, I mentioned the vaccination development uh, in early stages of COVID, that was a very good example. What we know is basically AI systems are much more superior in terms of speed, precision, scale, uh, and finding patterns in, in really complicated uh, structures that are not really, the, the patterns that are not really um, visible or, or, or obvious to, to human eye or human senses. Uh, and doing this in a very short time scale is a really a very important capability to complement human decision-making processes. So if, as long as we sort of formulate the whole thing, the AI assistance as assistance and really enhancing human capabilities, then what we are looking is really human AI teams who are achieving better than any a human can achieve or a, a machine can achieve essentially. So for me, the answer is yes. And bearing, I mean, the, the, looking at the time, I would like to just leave it to the other speakers, thanks. Thank you so much. Yes, AI systems are much superior in skills, scale, and finding patterns. And so, yes, they will address that. So I will move to Barista Ofodu to address the same question. Yeah, I would be a bit, I agree with what um, Professor Miyingo and Professor Engin has said. I would just be a, bit, a little bit skeptical to say, maybe because, again, from a legal perspective, I wouldn't want to just say yes. Um, you know, if we're talking about whether data and AI solutions can help improve decision making, I would think about it from a, I'll use a medical anecdote, right? Um, you know, we all know medicine would be good and medicine can work or solve problems, but only if we take them. So it's not necessarily about if they will be good, it's will they be relied upon and what would make them not be relied upon? Um, if we talk about, oh, medicine is good and medicine can help cure certain diseases, but do we have the medicine? Do we actually have um data and ai solutions that are available because literally this is a very new and burgeoning area when it comes to ai in healthcare it's still very new very very nascent so do we really have those solutions are they like when we read all this ai policy and this data driven sort of analysis do they carry concepts that govern the countries that we work in do we have access to them really and do we even have the right ones? Are we taking paracetamol for back pain? Or are we taking ibuprofen for like something? Like, what are these so are these solutions driven in a way that they're targeted at addressing the policy key issue? But I think for me, the biggest question is we have not been able to tap in how. How do we use these AI solutions? Every week there's a new report, AI this, AI. We've not been able to discover like how exactly do we transition this data and AI solutions in a way that can actually help improve decision making for public uh, health policymakers. The public health policymakers can download this report, but how do they sort of envelope it in their day to day work? We've not. There needs to be a special school on how to take that information and data and weave it into policy making and like um, policy implementation. Um, so we, we, we talk a lot about like open data and open AI, but we don't speak like we don't speak a lot around um the use of these solutions right and I, there's something we say from an african perspective it's a it's south african adage that says knowledge is like a baobab tree not one person one person's arm cannot embrace it right um there needs to be that understanding of there needs to be that collective approach every time i read an ai report i can tell if it's a medical person that wrote it or like a like a developer that wrote it uh, it's just it's lacking implementation substance um, until when policymakers can write policy documents 
on AI, then that way they're able to write this in a way that can digest for other policymakers as well. Um, so audience matters. I, most people just want to publish to say they this is where the first person to do this. Look at what we found. Look at how well you can use it. And it's almost at the end of the report, uh, policy considerations, bullet points, do this, do that. And the keywords, employability, um, transparency, fairness. But how? How does it transition? So I agree, yes, data and AI solutions can improve decision making, but we need to think about, do we have those decisions? Do we have those AI solutions? Are they fit or tailored for us? Um, and then how do we use them? We've not been able to explore that as well. Thank you so much. Um, I love this. Yes, data and AI solutions can improve decision making, but do we have the right AI solutions? Uh, how do we transition them in a way that will help policymakers? Uh, so I will move to Professor Ramnik to address the same question. Uh, Jude, thank you. Uh, I think I, I'm not going to disagree from what the others have said. I think Jake has put it very well. But I am. Uh, my answer is yes and no. Uh, yes, I think everybody has mentioned. I'm not going to repeat. Um, there's no doubt. COVID was a great example. I think a number of public health issues, including a patient-centric approach of health, can only be resolved if artificial intelligence, you know, a number of CT scans, the x-rays, the blood results from series of will help us make the best diagnosis for a patient eventually. I'm talking about a patient centric to a community centric eventually. But the no, the no from a policymaker perspective, um, the algorithms as Jake rightfully says, uh, one wrong algorithm in an AI or a non-biased data collection can, can, can be a catastrophe uh, in front of us. Um, we've seen it a little bit already um, through some artificial intelligence mechanisms where, um, where it does not help us from the human-centric approach that we've always used in the past. So I think, yes, uh, if uh, this, is a, this is an area that is growing uh, due to a uh, number of scientific evidence is coming. This is an area of discussion. That's why we are here together. And I think artificial intelligence is here to stay and not only to stay, but to control and rule the human mankind, not only in public health, but in every stream of, of our human survival in the future. But if not managed well, if not controlled well, if our political buy-in, as we go from the first question, with the scientific buy-in of evidence-based ethics and, and, and correct formulation of uh, evidence-based algorithms or tested algorithms are not put into public systems around health, it can create a catastrophe on the other side. So the big warning sign is that at, at current stage of artificial intelligence, reliability of public health policy alone on artificial intelligence is going to be catastrophic. But together with the scientific world building a very good ethical solution, as Jake rightfully says, can be the best advantages to human survival. So artificial intelligence will decide human survival, both in a positive and a negative way. Um, the COVID has got both examples, if I have to relate to you, of the artificial intelligence, both that obviously brought the real essence of why we're discussing, and it's a big yes, but there are elements in COVID-19 where algorithms have really killed us to the policymakers, where things have not gone to the level we had estimated to be. The predictions have gone wrong. So, so we have to be careful. I think uh, human intelligence and artificial intelligence together will be the solution to public health in all ways. Um, and, but, but better algorithms, better systems designing will in future. So it's, it's bound to here, but needs to be regulated, needs to be controlled, and needs to be managed very well. Awesome. AI is here to stay, need to be controlled, regulated, and need buy in, otherwise, it leads to a catastrophe. I will then move to closing remark and I will start with Dr. Mayongo. Please uh, give your closing remark and in closing remark, if you could talk a little bit about just how you avoid embedding biases in models, trend with non representative data and languages, that would be great. Very good. Can you repeat that, please? Yes, um, let me repeat that. How do we avoid embedding biases in models trained with non-representative data and languages? You don't have to, but just a closing remark. If you want to address that in your closing remark, that will be appreciated. I'll put that on chat. Yes, the, how do we avoid embedding biases in models trained with? Yeah. One of the things we've tried to do within 
and, and this is from the experience working with COVID, is to there's a lot of there's a lack of understanding on what biases exist within AI models and algorithms. So the, the, the whole process does the, the process does not start at the modeling stage, but rather at the design stage. So when you design, when you hypothesize your research, that's when the biases start. So those biases feed into the, the data that you collect. People will be missing at some point because of the way you hypothesize, the where you collect the data. So I think, uh, yeah, we've developed a tool that we we that is publicly available to to actually address the issues around, particularly around gender and intersectionality, but also identifying biases within the whole process. And this is this is based on discussions over a period of time with stakeholders within local government in both Kenya and Malawi. So over to you, Jude. Thanks. Thank you very much. I will move to Dr. Ingen for a closing remark. And if necessary, please address the same question, but you could just give your closing remark. Thank you. Uh, well, on the same question, I just want to say that bias issue, maybe we should say if we want to avoid em embedding bias, bias is not necessarily, well, we're talking about harmful bias, obviously, here. Uh, we need to remember that it's for, for an AI model to be usable, there are all sorts of biases, and the bias itself is a very complex problem to, to, to figure out anyways. So we, there will always be bias in AI systems as long as that's data uh, of, uh, sort of data driven or, or I mean data generated by the society as a whole. Anyway, what we're trying to do is really to to avoid any potential harms, potential replication of existing problems in human decision making processes, or or potentially even amplifying. We're trying to avoid amplifying the existing historical biases essentially. For that, I can only see the response. We can we can do uh, only as much as really what what we're able to see in each case. But what could potentially be a pollution, solution is to make our models really uh, as transparent as possible. Make our make the codes, make the data available for uh, scrutiny, for regulation, um, the, the, for 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 basically more eyes to to be on the on there and making our systems also. While making them open, open is not just enough. We also need to make them interoperable. We need to make sure that it's understandable by larger groups of um, uh, individuals and and interest groups, basically, and and that that can be again run. The same models can be run. Maybe the same analysis can be run by by different groups, uh, irrespective of or maybe not uh, minimizing the need for uh, complex compute infrastructure in the end. Uh, really, for me, I mean, a bias is to me is the biggest issue of AI, and uh, the solution, the only solution I can think of, really, to be to become as transparent as possible and as inter interoperable as possible. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Uh, Thank you, Mr. I will move to if we do to close in one minute or two. Thanks for having me and for, I think I'm really excited that you are doing inclusion by having a lawyer speak around this very intelligent, uh, very experienced people in AI. As a lawyer in AI, um, what I would say in terms of embedding bias, I would say four things. One would be, I think there must be a way to incentivize software developers who spend time to ensure that they are systems and their data are not because it takes time it takes effort to ensure that you're reducing the level of bias so by law the same way you incentivize people with tax uh, breaks we should give some form of incentives to people who do a lot of work um to deal with issues of bias especially because like zainab said um you know bias is one of the major problems that we have the second would be around we need to promote bias prediction models and sensitivity sensitivity checks so within the legal space, we need to create frameworks that, you know, like a step-by-step, -step, what and what did you do to ensure that your data is representative, to ensure that the people who work on this are representative as well? Have you considered this? We need to ensure that those steps are created, especially because this is still new. The law is, we're really struggling as lawyers to catch up with you guys here. Um, but one other thing I would emphasize is 
which is new in law, is debiasing orders. I think we need to give orders to certain AI systems that have really turned rogue to say, look, you need to go back again, start afresh, go and debias. In fact, go and, you know, it's a more legal, it's, a, I mean, it's been used in a case, I don't want to mention one of the big tech companies who was given an, an order by the court to go back and ensure that their systems are debiased. These are the kind of things I want to see. But lastly, I, I would speak about a human rights algorithmic impact assessment for AI systems for healthcare. I think it's important to ensure that um, we need to think about uh, an impact assessment for every AI system when it comes to healthcare, such that patients can have the rights to contest bias, Patients can actually report faulty or flawed AI systems. Um, it's very particular for us in the third world when we know fully well that bias would affect, you know, uh, people living with disabilities, women, people who are black, LGBTQ populations, and the rest of that. So um, these are some of the views, I think, incentivization, counteraction, bias prediction and sensitivity checks, debiasing orders by the law. And of course, um, human rights algorithmic impact assessment can actually help um, um, in this regard. Thank you so much for having me and thanks for including me in your panel. We don't see this very often. <laughs> thank you very much. I, I will move to Professor Ramnik for one uh, minute. Thank you. Uh, I think I should also use this opportunity on behalf of the panelists to say thank you to you, Jude, and to the organizers. I think um, at one time we should listen to you too because uh, we should have your opinion considering that you work so much and so much in detail around the artificial intelligence work and your work is phenomenal uh, Jude uh, and the whole team who's organized this. Um, from my, uh, from my, uh, my last comments and specifically uh, keeping in note is that I think the human survival and the world we are heading towards requires us to be all together in this, uh, which means ethics play a huge role. Uh, one of the biggest way of removing bias is by community participation and public buy-in. Uh, people will not buy in, we will not win anything from the artificial intelligence mechanism, whether it's patient-centric, whether it's community data. Uh, human buy-in is very critical and human buy-in can only happen if it's ethical, if, it's, uh, if it gives back to what the concerns are. Uh, people see value to it. And I think uh, for every developer of artificial intelligence, the most important is to put the human first and see what value will the human get out of it? Why, would, why should he or she come into our system in order for us to give us that value and get the value out of it? Now you're developing a system for a patient, say for any example, the patient might say, okay, I can get my records any time when I need it. I'm going to become learned out of it. Whereas the private sector or pharmaceutical or researchers will use this data for human advancement or developing new, new methodologies to save humans. Parallelly, if you're looking at policymakers and community data perspective, so data mining through artificial intelligence needs to be ethical, needs to be valued. Uh, it needs to be cross-border. It needs to be, there's no Canada and there's no South Africa. We all together for the same human survival. Uh, ozone layer depletion in South Africa will cause the same harm to Canada as much as it's gonna cause it to South Africa. So we all united. COVID was a perfect example to show, to show that um, storing vaccines in Canada will not save population in Kenya, uh, but distributing it jointly will control the virus and the viral spread. So I think the world is going to be different going forward. Um, it needs these values, uh, which we have discussed today. And I think it's very high time that we as policymakers, scientific world, and I'm looking for more scientists um, um, to come up into political world together, to marry the scientific world with the political world. And that's the only solution of how AI will grow in the future. But on the other side, I uh, really enjoyed everyone. You all are fantastic. And uh, thank you very much for putting all this together. Thank you very much. Um, I will then close the session. And at the end of the day, I want to thank everyone that have taken time to come and share with us. I want to thank the experts that came and shared their knowledge with us, with the Global Health Experts. I, I want to thank the organizers of the conference for giving us this platform. Thank you very much. And we're sort of winning above time. Thanks a lot. Goodbye, everyone. We're looking forward to connecting with you. Thanks, Jude. And I also want to thank the uh, Cooper for organizing. Thank the ISF for funding and all the speakers and panelists and the audience for your time. 
uh, we want to organize this again next year and please will send a survey please send your feedback and thank you all uh, really appreciate uh, Jude it's uh, amazing <laughs> to work with you uh, let's do this again yeah so thank you yeah thank you Dr. Remy. thank you Jack Lynette, and Sylvia uh, thank all, you I don't see you thank you I, I know it's a very late uh, at the India or Kenya. <laughs> so it's uh, appreciative. Yeah. Bye, everyone. Yeah, so. Bye, everyone.